You ready? Yeah. Okay, this is your main electrical room. Main disconnect will turn off power to the whole building. Okay. Um, you got your transfer switches here. These aren't the actual transfer switches, this is what feeds power to the transfer switch. So if you ever lose power on the main, the transfer switch will actually transfer it into emergency power. This cell and this cell is what feeds all the suites, all the distribution panels on the floors. Um, you got a transformer, uh, sorry, a disconnect that feeds a transformer in another electrical room. And this one here is your distribution panel up on the roof. This disconnect here feeds this panel, which is your snow melt system, which is this. Uh, this works off a sensor, so when there's snow and cold temperature, the ramp heating will actually turn on, and the two stairs as well. You got the one stair in the back corner and the one stair on the north, north uh, east. east side that has snow melt. Okay, this is for your garage exhaust fans. Everything's labeled in the panels. So you got a panel schedule, and it's all labeled what does what. Okay. Uh, these starters are for these fans in here. That's your CO panel. Basically, when let's say a car is idling out in the parking lot, the CO level reaches a certain amount, the fans will kick on. The fans, if there's a, if the fans are running and there's a fire alarm, like the alarm's going off, the fans will turn off. Okay. And there's an override switch in the fire alarm panel for the fire department. If they want to activate the fans while they're shut down, they're able to. They can bypass that. Here is the meter for the whole building. And this is your fire alarm meter. This feeds the elevators, it feeds a splitter on the roof that actually powers up your four elevators, or three elevators, sorry. Uh, just follow the tags. You got a 75 kVA transformer. It tells you panel 60 MP. What panels, what, what switch is operating. You got two transfer switches. You got this transfer switch and that transfer switch. Um, here you have this panel controls all your sump pumps. Okay. Okay. And there's a starter on the wall above the stump, sump pump itself. Yeah. So this just supplies power to it. This here's your, your uh, starter for your stair press fan. You only have one stair press fan in this building, and it's the stairs that are on the north side here. Okay. This is also tied into the fire alarm system. That stair press fan will only activate an alarm to pressurize the stairwell. And if smoke is detected in that fan system, in the ductwork of that fan, it'll actually shut down the stair press fan. And can manually turn it on? It'll actually, you can manually bypass it, but you don't touch it. Like, that's something you don't touch. The only person that should actually manually bypass it will be the fire department if they deem it need to be. If that shuts off, it means there's smoke in the ductwork. If you turn that fan back on, you're just going to be pumping smoke into the, into the stair. You know what I mean? All the panels are marked, panel EMS, it tells you the voltages and the system it is. This just does miscellaneous receptacles, once again there's a schedule, everything's there. This panel here is for the laundry room that's located right outside the door. Same thing, it's just a circuit panel, does receptacles lighting. Same thing if you follow this, like this feeds that panel that panel, so these are the main distribution boards, these are your lighting panels, you really have nothing to do with this, these oh, are the yeah. panels you look at, okay, so this has your heat tray system, so all your pipes that are out in the parking garage that have water in them that are uh, susceptible to freezing, well actually you have a heat tray, so it just keeps the pipe warm, doesn't freeze the water, now, come over here for a minute, you ever see a tripped breaker? You should be looking at these breakers daily. Make sure they're not tripped. These ones with the orange and the heat trace. Because you want to make sure the heat trace is working properly. If you ever see a tripped breaker, don't just turn it into the on position because now that is not on. Okay? 
you need to go off and then on. Okay? That's one of the other issues we always have in a lot of buildings. They don't understand. And, uh, they think they turned it back on, but they haven't. Okay? This is the same thing. It's just a panel. It feeds some other panels located in other rooms and floors. Um, and here's your panel schedule. It tells you everything. Okay. These here. This here is... Call in the other room, I said these two switches control the power that's in the suites. That comes here, and then these are broken into three different sections. So you'll have, let's say, two and second floor and third floor that are fed from this guy, fourth and fifth, so on and so on. There's another one of these located on the roof. This is a transformer for that. Okay? This is for the suites. That's for the suites. But if you turn that off, you're going to turn off like two floors. Okay, so you got a thermostat for your fan in the room. You got a thermostat for the heat in the room. Okay, the fan is actually controlled through the fire alarm system. It needs to be shut down on alarm, so that automatically gets done through this fire alarm control. starter for your compressor. I need you to pay attention to this. It's really important here. Mm -hmm. This here is not a thermostat for the room. Okay. That controls the fans or the heat. This here is a thermostat that's linked up to the control the fire alarm panel. So if there if the temperature in here drops below 10 degrees, it's gonna send the signal to my fire alarm panel letting you know that this room is too cold. It'll actually read sprinkler room low temperature. Okay. Do not touch this, do not adjust it, that stays like that forever and ever. Okay? Mm -hmm. A lot of times people will think that's for the heat, they turn it up, then they pump in because there's a problem with the panel. So this is the only one needs to be... So that's the only one. Okay? Do not touch this one here. This big red box here is basically part of the fire alarm system. Um, and basically that's wired into all these valves. So if somebody turns off a valve, it's going to send a signal to the fire alarm panel. So if someone's like, you know, messing around or if there's a service guy in here, you will get a signal at the panel. All your sprinkler valves are monitored. Okay. Once again, this is, this is your sprinkler stuff, but our fire alarm is tied into them. So if anyone comes and turns this switch, which will shut down water to the floor, you'll know. You'll get a signal at the panel, you can investigate. That's specifically for our 16 floor. That's correct. It's it's floor has this one. That's correct. Each floor has that. So. This is your generator. Mm -hmm. Here's your control panel. You see, it has an alarm list. So if you do have alarms, they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And it's also tied into the fire alarm system. So if there's any problem. If this screen sees any trouble with the generator, it's going to send a signal down to the fire alarm panel. From there, it'll tell you generator trouble. You can come up and you can see what the trouble is, make your phone call, call the proper maintenance guy. Um, my fire alarm panel will actually tell you if it's running as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it'll tell you fire alarm, uh, sorry, generator trouble or generator running. So when it is running, it tells you, it sends a signal down there. It lets you know that it's running. It runs off gas, right? This is a uh, natural gas, yeah. Okay. It's a natural gas, so there's no need for diesel or anything. Okay? There you go. We have two of these buttons, one located here, one located by the other floor. They're emergency gas shut off for your boilers. So if you push this button, your boilers will turn off. Okay? Okay, this is another part of the fire alarm system monitors all these which is your makeup air um, elevator machine room circuits and all that so anytime there'll be a trouble with the, say any of the fire alarm devices you will get a signal down at the fire alarm panel this panel here takes care of pretty much all the receptacles on the roof and like in the boiler room and lighting and everything everything's labeled here you got window washing plugs, mechanical room receptacles, etc. etc. This here 
has boilers. So your boilers are fed out of here. Again, you got a schedule here with it that tells you what boiler is what circuits. Okay. Okay, same thing here. This really has nothing much to do with it, it just feeds each individual panel. Okay? This here is the top eight floors of suites. So half the building is fed from the one I showed you downstairs, the other half is fed from up here. Okay? down on fire alarm, so the fire alarm system will automatically shut off, uh, and it's also equipped with a smoke duct detector, so if it senses any smoke in the duct, it will shut down and send an alarm to the panel. Is this the Yep, that's oh, okay. the over there. When it's dark, they'll turn on. If daylight, they turn off. So I will cover it manually. No. That is your monitoring for the panel. Anytime you get a trouble or an alarm, uh, a signal will be sent to your monitoring company and they'll call you. Mm -hmm. If it's a trouble, they'll call you. If it's an alarm, they're going to dispatch fire department right away. Um, you'll see any troubles come up here. It's an addressable system, so it'll actually tell you exactly where it is. Um, the smoke detectors in the elevator lobbies will recall the elevator, so if any one of those smoke detectors right in front of the elevator goes off, the elevators will recall down to the ground floor. If it's the ground floor one that goes off, the elevators will recall to the second floor. Okay? Um, once that happens and Depending on the situation, once it gets reset, you got to actually physically go to the elevator, reset the elevator. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's it. Thank you. Done. We good? Yep. Okay. Okay, uh, so the panel is recorded? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this is our uh, water control panel for the uh, cooling tower. So basically this is an automated system. There's three dosing pumps here. One is uh, dedicated for the uh, corrosion and scale inhibitor for the tower. And there's two other pumps for the biocides to prevent the bacteria contamination of the tower. So uh, the biocides, uh, these are uh, being fed in the system uh, based on the size of the tower, like 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, twice a week and the uh, corrosion and scale inhibitor it's based on the makeup water that goes into the tower like uh, we can do 15 minutes per 100 gallons of makeup water okay. or 10 minutes based on the size and what you can see here too are we have a, on the PVP uh, probe here we have a glow meter just to make sure flow there's a flow in the uh, in the system. So these pipes are connected to the pumps, condenser pumps, and we have some strainer here too. If there's any debris, you can remove this if there's because this system will show you everything what's going happening on the system. Like if there's no flow, so probably this system is black, so you just have to remove this strainer here. And uh, the rest of the parameters you can see on this panel too, like the control parameters, like the right on the PVP for the tower. And uh, we have also a solenoid lead bulb here. So this is also automated. If the, uh, when the PVP goes up beyond 1200, this lead bulb will open and drain some water out of the system. Because uh, cooling tower should have a conductivity between 800 to 1200 microsiemens to avoid the corrosion or on the scale uh, formation in the uh, cooling tower. So just basically what we 
we do here, we do servicing too and commissioning of these uh, robot pilots for polygon. Alright. system, uh, a closed loop system should be treated with uh, corrosion inhibitor because uh, one corrosion inhibitor does is provide the uh, thin film of uh, protection for the pipe because uh, pipes are made of steel and make up water or portable water, have water, oxygen and there's uh, minerals so to avoid those uh, corrosion on the pipes we provide treatment on closed loop system. What you'll see here is a pad feeder in a filter housing. So this uh, filter house, uh, pad feeder here, this is, this is where we add chemicals and uh, a filter cartridge here, uh, around 20 microns. They have to be uh, regularly monitored for for the condition so we can we can also schedule that for uh, proper maintenance by changing it every two months or three months based on the condition of the filter for a start up operation normally they're dirty so you have to regul regularly monitor them every month for any particulate matter that's uh, accumulate on this uh, filter. They're equipped with isolation valves. Uh, one right, one right one here right and one right, right, right there. there. Yeah. That's what I was looking for, very good. Yeah, so just in case there's a leak or you need to add chemicals, this has to be closed. And uh, we also provide uh, system test or monitor to test what's the concentration of the inhibitor inside. If there's a glyco, we check the glyco concentration. And uh, basically that's it for a closed system. Okay. The pressure here normally at 30 PSI. If that goes below that, this uh, glyco hill will automatically feed up the system. Okay. Why is it closed? It's currently unplanned now. It's closed. So we got to make sure that the glycol strength is good. The summer coil, and this gets drained every year, right? So the, that would be drained out there so we don't freeze any anything that's inside the piping. So it's draining it. That, that would be a part of the changeover. So your, your, build, your contractor that's looking after your building would have to drain all that. To make sure that nothing's there. So this is your air vent. Just opening up that guy is not going to be enough. We've got to introduce the air into it, which they hopefully did. And yeah, over here. So this will get drained every year. And your, these valves are going to control whether you want more cooling or less cooling. Open and close. Same thing on this one here, which is probably some valve.
there's always water coming out. Yeah. Yeah. They got the air filters in here that we just saw, right? So we put these guys on to get changed for this long thing. And that's gonna clean up any of the air that's going into the building. Try to keep the dust free. Uh, they look like they got maybe a, not much more longer left like on. Not much left. So that's there. And then you have your, your filters, your final filters. You'll, you can tell, you'll see what's, what a clean filter is going to look like, what your pressures are here, on the suction side of things. Um, if they start to get dirty, we'll, we'll end up changing those. Uh, so like that one? Yeah. Yeah, this one here, this is the pre-filter, so it should, it's probably on, on here, and then the final filter is on the other side, right? So. If it was clean, this one here may be at a, at a lower pressure. Right now it's at a higher pressure. Um, other than that, the, the variable speed, I don't know if automation's on this yet. We don't know. I think so. And there is? Yeah, so Eagle Controls has controls of that, I guess, uh, on here. Uh, as far as that, you're just looking, at the, the motor will have to get, uh, Greased and, uh, and the bearings on there. That's something that we would do, or the contractor would do. The bells. Just listen for, you know, abnormal noise, vibration from the unit. Um, if something doesn't sound right. It's something going on. Like again, that's going to be water coming out of there. That's a normal thing to do. And change over. We got to drain that water. Any questions? Mike, want to cover anything? Oh, that was pretty good. Okay. What I what I what I would recommend though, <laughs> just it's just going up, is that I would actually paint the floor right here. If it, like if you put a drain on the floor, it's going to be a trip hazard. Yeah. What I would do is actually have that painted yellow on the floor, so that when somebody's walking by, if there is water, at least they see. They may not see the water, but they'll see the yellow, which is caution, meaning watch what you're doing, right? And that's what I would do if this is to remain like that, because I doubt very much they're gonna. They won't chip away the concrete make a trough and they won't put a pipe they should not put a pipe that becomes a trip hazard so take their pick they might put a pipe there i'm not sure but just leaving it like that creates a, a trip hazard a slip hazard on the floor okay. yeah you can't do much about it i'll just go pick up my uh, rubber divider your, your, your main chiller your, your main cooling system for the building okay um, this thing here is going to take care of all your cooling needs for all the suites, but in one big gulp. Okay. So we have the chilled water that's going to be circulating through the building with your pumps. Okay. It's going to go to each, each, each suite. And each suite has their own little unit. So if we're providing cold water to those suites, there's going to be a fan that's going to blow over that cold water and it's going to cool down their suites. So we're going to circulate that water. We're, the chiller, it's a large piece of equipment, it's expensive, but it, its only purpose of life is to provide a chilled water, cold water, leaving this pipe here down to your building, okay? That's all it needs to do. It says I'll do whatever I need to do to do that. Okay. So we're looking at around 45 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So our warm water that's going to come in from the building, because everybody used up their cooling system of the water, to warm it up, is going to come through the chiller. The chiller is going to cool it down, which we'll talk about in a second here. Cool down that water and leave out of here at 45 degrees up to your building. And that's all it's going to do. It's just going to loop around. Okay? It needs flow to start. It needs this to work. So this pump here, which is going to be here, is going to be doing that all the time. It's going to be flowing water. What's that? This is the fan coil. It's possibly... It's also, yes. okay, that's just fan coil, I'll show water pumps are outside, okay. Usually they put them in the same room. So, that pump will be running all the time. Um, the other things that are happening here, it's gonna be using other pumps like the condenser pump and the cooling tower. But in the most pur for the whole purpose of the chiller is to get warm water here and cool it down. Um, the chiller is gonna be operating, trying to do that, and it's gonna be making sounds and sounding different and working harder, working less, depending on how much warm water is coming in, how much work it has to do to do that, okay? The refrigerant that we have in here that's going to do that job is 134A, okay? It's right here. 
Uh, we still need to charge that in the machine. It's, it's empty right now. It's hopefully got a nitrogen charge in here. Well, we're going to be charging that in the refrigerator. Um, the temperature setting on that is 45, I believe. 45. Okay. If it comes down to below 45, 4 degrees below, that's a normal. If it gets down to 41, then the machine will turn off, warm back up again, and come back on. Okay. Automatically. Automatically. Um, but because you have a variable speed drive, which we'll talk about that, that can pretty much hold that temperature pretty good. So you won't be. I, I don't suspect you will be shutting off on the water temperature. Okay. So the refrigerant that we have here is 134A. It's a high pressure refrigerant. It's always going to be under pressure uh, and it's going to always try to escape. You know, it's trying to leave. So we have a sensor here in the room and that sensor is going to detect whether it's clean air to breathe in, in here or not. It's not going to detect, let's say, a leak that's going on over on the other side. But if there's enough refrigerant in the room, then that detect that sensor is going to detect that, and then it'll start to uh, enable your refrigerant alarm system. So I'm sorry, which I brought this, that I got distracted. That's okay. This sensor does. That sensor is going to is going to try to sense any refrigerant that's in the room. Okay. If there's a leak, and that's just telling you that you can walk into the room. If it says zero parts per million, that means you can walk in the room and you have clean air to breathe. It's not necessarily going to detect a small leak that's occurring on the other side. Because okay. it's not enough to, to saturate the room with refrigerant. Okay. Okay, it's getting dissipated. In the event that it does detect a large leak on here, you'll have your exhaust fan system come on and, and exhaust the room. Okay. Okay. So before you walk in, I think there's one outside here. So when you walk in, you're going to look at that, that does not say zero parts per million. That means there's no leak detected. The air is clean enough to go outside there. Okay. In the event, you can also start starting your fan through manually outside here. So if I hit that button, we should be able to put the exhaust system on. Okay. So let's see if that fan on. So at the same time, what's going to happen is. Your damper's opened up, and your exhaust system is, is exhausting the leak. Okay, so you can manually turn on the, uh, the, the exhaust. At the same time, we don't want to, in this winter time, cool down this room because there's water in here that things that can freeze. So you want to make sure that the room temperature is, is adequate. We're not going below freezing. So they should have enough heat in the room to do this. That work. Right now, I'm feeling very hot in here. Uh, it's probably because we have the doors open and so forth, but there should be some sort of heat source in here, which right there. on the other side here. Yeah, so we have a heat source in there. So right now our fan is exhausting. We're bringing fresh air in, and we're exhausting air out of here. Bottom. So that will clean up here. So I'll turn that on. I'll leave it off. So down. Any questions so far with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, what happens in the condo uh, world is we have a one pipe system, right? So we switch from heating to cooling. Yeah. So we're on heating right now, our system's running hot water throughout the building. Now, in order, that same water that's got heat in it through the boilers will have to go through here. So if we want to start this chiller up, let's say on, on Friday, we have to shut the heat off today and let the temperature of that water cool down. We cannot introduce hot water into here. If we do that, then we'll blow the relief valves. We have these things, the pressure in the system will get too great, we'll blow it. So if you're thinking of doing changeovers, you need at least a couple of days before you do this changeover. Allow the water to cool or heat up. Right? You don't want cold water going into your boilers and you don't want hot water going into your chiller. So you need that, that two days last time. And that's why we don't want that water coming in here. So we have to isolate the system and we do a changeover. We switch the valve and say now you're gonna, your water system is going to run through the chiller rather than run through the boilers and vice versa. Okay. So they should be locked off. Um, they gave you some, some uh, gauges on, on piping on there. Uh, for this system here, it's most likely going to be the right, uh, it's going to be a consistent pressure. So it's not a bad idea if you're doing your round. 
you know, mark on there that it's, this one's always, let's say, at 40 and this guy's always at uh, 50. If something's changed, then what's happened? Did, uh, did the water pressure drop? Did we lose water and so forth? So you're looking at your gauge to see that they're correct. Uh, again, so this is where all the cooling happens on here. There might be some condensation occurring, uh, some water dripping, but you're looking for any oil stains, uh, any water stains. Uh, water's condensation, so something's not insulated. If there's any oil on the floor, that's a good sign that there might be a leak going on. Okay. So you're going to use your senses again. It's, it's pretty simple. Sight, sound, smell. If something looks different uh, in here, or smells different, or sounds different, is there a problem? May not be, but that's what you're going to start off with. The chiller is going to make different sounds uh, depending on the load. The drive is going to slow down the machine. The, the motor and the compressor is going to open up and get more more gas in it. and it's going to just try to balance itself out so if you hear the machine i don't i don't i don't have a concern if the machine's burping once in a while it goes like, eh, you know eh. but if it's going wah you know a real elephant uh horn sound and it continue doing that there's a problem going on out here okay typically that's because of your cooling tower that plays a huge part of this. Um, since we're on this side of it all, um, uh, there's no need to go inside here. There's nothing to do inside here. This is a variable speed drive for the low pump. Uh, there's no reset button. There's high voltage going on in here. With your chiller on this side, this is your control panel. Unfortunately, it's a little high. Here's your on and off button. That's going to be your off. And all the way to the left and release is going to be your on. Yes, just in case we reset it. But why are we going to reset it? Let's find out why we're resetting before we do it. So if you came, if you came to, you called us and since John's going to go look after this, hey, there's something wrong with my chiller. The more information you give us uh, over the phone, it kind of helps us, you know, determine what we need to do before we come out, or help you out and say, hey, somebody turned your pump on. Now the screen, when it is lit, it's not supposed to be blank will have some lettering on the top here. So if you do call us, you can say, well, the chiller's off and it says cycling shutdown contacts, chilled water flow switch over. Yeah, just let us know what it says on the display on there. And then we can help you out uh, and get the building up and running. Okay. There's no other things to do inside here. There's no reset buttons or anything. Eagle controls will can be controlling this chiller uh, through the automation starting and stopping it. They may do something with temperature reset. If it's too cold outside, they may shut it off. But we'll, when we get the contract, uh, and so when we've got power on it, we'll show you how, how that all works. On that. So it's all good. Uh, our site glass here, you might see a level here going on on the, on the site glass. Okay. It's going to be a clear, clear fluid, and there might be some little bit of foam going on on the top. <laughs> Not just going to be your oil on the top there. That's going to be on that side of it. Uh, back over to here, we have our variable speed drive. Uh, that power will be on and left on all the time, all year round. Uh, there's no need for you to go inside here. There's high voltage, there's storage voltage, so don't, don't need to reset anything. If there's a problem, the screen is blank, give us a call. Uh, back on this side here, uh, we have our, our oil cooler here that's going to cool down the oil. Okay, Our oil filter, which we're going to change. Uh, as far as you're concerned, maybe take a look at that bottle once in a while, that that bottle's not filling up with oil. It will fill up eventually, but what rate is it filling up? If it's filling up in, in week, there's a problem. But every Every three weeks or every month it fills up in the half an inch, that's fine. Okay. So that bottle there, but we'll we're gonna be coming in here every month and seeing that anyways ourselves. Well, what should I do if I it? it just give us a call. You know, unless it's totally full. But uh, you know, if you say hey yesterday it was it was down at the bottom and today it's full, there's a problem. Okay. Um, there's no need to turn anything off on here um, or, or or switch over as far as your operator is concerned. Uh, there is an oil level that's going on on the machine, uh, and that's on this, this kind of sight glass right in the middle there. 
it's going to be hard to see. Um, and that level there will be red right now with the red line. If there was oil, it would make it thicker. Okay, so you have to kind of find your right zone to see it. Okay, so you see that, that, that uh, oh, yeah. right there? See how the red line is thin? Yeah. Because there's no oil in it? When there's oil in it, it'll be thick. The, the, the red would be thicker. Uh, so we want to be somewhere in the green when we're running. Okay. Um, back over to the condenser side on here, you will have a level in here going on in there. We want to maintain a half a slight glass going on in there. Uh, you may experience, depending on the load of the chiller, if it doesn't have a lot of work to do, it may give you a yellow warning on the screen, loss of condenser flow. Give us a call, we'll explain to you what's going on. So communication is a big thing on that. Um, back here, they're going to have to get us a, a chemical treatment service provider to, to work on to get the good chemical treatment for the cooling tower. And that's a key thing for the chiller. It keeps the tube something that you can't see but causes problems so over the years. You want the tubes to be nice and clean and, and uh, not uh, calcified or, or, or uh, Kitted or anything like that, and the chemical treatment is going to be taking care of that. So right now they have to still set this up. There's a lot of things they still haven't done. Um, cooling tower, there's your condenser pumps over here. These, these pumps will operate uh, one only, most likely, when the chiller's operating. When the chiller's off, these pumps will be on. So they'll, they'll alternate on that. They'll alternate on that. I do it on the Yeah. I do that every Friday. Yeah, I don't know. Our chiller is just going to send out a signal. They, this may be, the, the way they may have this is if they're both in auto and one turns off, maybe this guy comes on automatically. Right? And then you can put that back on. I don't know how they have it set up on here, but they should only, well, the pump should only operate when the chiller's operating. So that's something we'll have to see if it's a manual switchover. Or is it one of those ones where this is always going to be really in and switch this to not have any Okay. Uh, in the winter time, things will get drained out of this out of the condenser water in the cooling tower. So we don't want any water to be exposed outside and freezing up. Also the make up air water, the makeup water will be turned off and so forth. Uh, nothing to do with the valving with you. Don't have to change any valving on here. Uh, they, sh they will, I guess, at some point in time, have some gauges on here, here and here. Again, as, as yourself, if you're walking by, if it's a clean system and this says 30 and that says 20, everything's good. If this starts to say 50 and this starts to say 10, there's a problem. Okay. So your gauges are, are something that, just like a doctor looking at your blood pressure, see how that works. Okay, you're looking for any water, ground, any abnormal sounds, and so forth. Um, that's basically what I want to give you. Okay. Is there anything else you want to think about? Yeah. Well, I have to go. You'll get a second chance when when uh, our team comes in. Right? There won't be a chiller mechanic. You can feel free to ask all kinds of questions. And, I will too, don't worry. Yeah. So don't yeah. feel okay. like you're stopping. No, I, I have experience with this too. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, uh, more experience than Yeah. The panel's pretty easy uh, for you to look at and go through. So uh, it's, it's a decent, uh, de decent panel for you to work on. It's a good uh, technician with the DBS before and it gets yeah. me up to operate this. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a lot nicer when there's power on it but we'll, and hearing it run, but uh, we'll get to there. I mean, if we're looking after you, then. Come off every year. Okay. So we'll be taking this off, cleaning the tubes. So there'll be water coming down. Looks like it's this slope down there. So we'll see how that works out. Every five years, we'll also take this off too. Uh, this section here and the other section should get insulated. Otherwise, you're going to have condensation occurring. Now, why are you saying, well, who's going to do that? The thing is, is that the chiller gets purchased, they don't send them with the ends insulated because they just get ripped up. 
so it gets done in, in, on, on site. So the contractor should be coming back and insulating this side and the other side. So you're not going to have any condensation. I'm keeping you here because I want you to get more, more and more. Okay, I'm done talking. <laughs> how building automation works with them, and then uh, we'll kind of touch on the different kind of different codes that are going to show up on the bars here, which I'm sure you guys have already seen a bunch before. Um, and we'll go over what's important, what's not, what's worth noting, and where you can go and see them in the history. Um, so to start off, these are Canadian boilers. They're Canadian made. Um, they're dynamo line boilers, so it's just the name of the model. And basically, all that's saying is they're non-condensing boilers. They're designed to have water coming to the boiler above 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's probably the most important part about these boilers. Um, if they have return water below 130 degrees Fahrenheit for a long period of time, what will happen is there will be condensing not only in the boiler but in the vent as well. So the vent, um, the actual blue vent, is designed to be able to handle condensing acidic water. And the boiler, for the most part, can handle a little bit, but over time, if lots and lots and lots of acidic water sits there, you're going to run into problems where they need to be cleaned more, more maintenance issues. It's not something that's going to cause the boiler to just fail outright, but it will just shorten the lifespan of certain components. Um, so that's the, the return temperature that sit on here. Right now we're at a return of 157. And you said it was supposed to be 140. Minimum of 130. Return. In the shoulder months, you'll get close to that, unless this is a primary loop system, yeah, it's like it is. Um, and when I say primary loop, they'll have a minimum temperature. It's probably around 160 to make sure your domestic hot water uh, indirectly gets the amount of heat it needs. Um, so when we're looking at the screen, there's two screens that you'll see that are being set up. There's this that you can see, but really, all the screens should be left like this. This gives you a nice little snapshot of everything that's going on with the boiler at any given time. Uh, in this case, we've got our inlet and outlet temperature that's at the back of the boiler. Our 4 to 20 signal coming in from the BAS, so I'll touch on that in a second. Uh, a live flame signal as to what's going on uh, in terms of what the flame rod's reading. And then you've got your set points here. Um, we have a set point of 170. That's measuring off of the return. In the setup of these boilers, this set point, it will never achieve that set point more than likely because the BAS is going to be controlling modulation. So how much or how little this boiler fires is completely dictated by this signal that it gets in. Between 4 and 20 milliamps, 20 milliamps being 100% and 4 milliamps being about 20% fire rate. Um, and the reason why we have this set point up so high is so it doesn't get in the way of building modulation. So if you ever find that the boilers are shutting down and you're not getting to the temperature that you're supposed to, or your BAS company is saying you're not getting the temperature you're supposed to, it could be because this is limiting you. But more than likely, I think that's probably the proper setup because this is going to be a constant temperature system. Whereas other, if you've worked in other buildings, um, some boilers have a setup where if it's warm outside, the temperatures are going to be much cooler. If it's hot outside, the temperatures are going to be, sorry, if it's really cold outside, the temperatures are going to be much hotter. Whereas this is probably going to be a very constant temperature that's going to be going on throughout the day. Is there an alarm? Would we be able to see an alarm on the screen? Yes, there are lots of alarms that um, this, this boiler, these boilers really have their own computers on here. Um, um, and you'll see there's a potential for thousands of ones. There's really only a few that will show up when any one thing's going on. Um, gentleman over there from John's Kittles made a good point. A lot of the time when boilers go down, it's not because something has failed within the boiler, but it's because the safety's open because something in the system isn't working to the standards of the boiler. Um, it's about 75% of the time that's what's going on. Um, and we'll see that. Any message that shows up, we'll show up on this history bar here. We'll take a look at that in one second. Um, so it'll either show up yellow, orange or red. Uh, these are kind of just color codes to give you a quick idea of what's going on, what it's trying to tell us. Yellow is a hold code. A uh, hold code typically is just uh, the boilers waiting for a safety to close. It always happens on startup and it always shows at um, shutdown. On startup there's one safety that needs to close, the air proofing switch, as that fan ramps up. So you'll see that every time. It's a hold 67 as well. So it's an example of 
it's, a, it's, it's showing us something, it's technically an alarm, but it is completely normal operation. You'll see it every time the boiler starts up. Um, orange is a little bit different. Orange, uh, an orange code is something that's changed, where the boiler still may be able to fire, still be able to, may, may be able to provide heat for the building, but that orange code is saying something's different, something's wrong, and it's need to refer to something else, or something's changed. Now, when we came up here, there was an alert showing. To take an alert, to take a look at alert or a lockout, the lockout's in a second, we press the history bar, and then we have access to either or. We'll take a look at the, the alerts, and it'll list previous ones that have occurred. The most recent one that we saw uh, was a normal recycle. The flame was not on at the end of ignition period. So there's two things that could, could happen here. Um, it's basically saying, so the boiler tried to fire right at the end of when the fire was, the flame was supposed to be there, and didn't measure it. So it gave us this alert, and then it tried to fire again. This could be a, a few things. More than likely, what happens when we see this in EAS is integrated, was the EAS probably told this boiler to fire at some point. And before it could fire, while it was in its ignition trial, the demand was over. So when that happens, it'll get a late for the boiler. Exactly. So the boiler will note that, basically say, well, flame was not on at the end of ignition. The fact that they had one would be in disorder, that would be the lead boiler, that would be the lag, or... I thought, typically that's the layout, which is numbered in one, two, three, but they have labeled this one as master on the right, so okay. assuming that's their master framework. In terms of how these boilers work, that's completely dependent on the module, uh, the BAS system. So if they choose that to be the master, then that's your master. Uh, but typically, they'll be evening out run times and things like that. our operation daily, so we should check for any uh, alarms here. Yeah, we so should probably check for any leaks. Yeah. yeah, so the big things to look for on a boiler system, if you're coming up and looking daily, is for sure make any notations if there's a change in on the history here. I would just note it down. If the boiler's not firing, that was the third final setup. It's a lockout, it's a red bar. That's a lockout, so it's your standard setup on any kind of gas fire appliance. When something goes wrong, it goes red, it won't fire until you actually manually reset it. Usually what the super will do is this. Yeah, a hard reset, just power on and off. So is that fine? Is that okay? That's okay, but I wouldn't recommend doing it before you make a phone call. Uh, when lockouts are using Okay, so it looks like there wasn't much happening until I came and adjusted it already. So now they the Yeah. And one year, bumper to bumper, everything. 
Yeah, so if something fails due to um, poor manufacturing or some kind of electrical failure, something like that, unless, uh, and every time uh, a warranty claim takes place, your mechanical contractor, Primo in this case, will come in, assess it, um, they'll determine what's going on, we might be involved as well. Um, they'll remove the part, they'll replace the part, the part needs to be purchased and put in, then they can take that whole part, submit it to Camus, and we... Where I'm stuck when it comes to maintenance, you know, like they say the third year. You should do maintenance every year, right? The only thing is we figure out that oh, yeah. the boiler has to be well, opened. Open. No, open. open. no, open. 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 Yeah, it should be cleaned every year. We check the gasket, there is the original one, but we do right away. There was no maintenance on it. Well, when, when? When did you see that there was no maintenance? Uh, that was on the other day. Oh, on the other day. That, that's something that I highly recommend. If you want to hear, you have to open it. Yeah, I would highly recommend that. Okay, right from the top, anything else? Because usually the that's how you get the baggage from the top. Yeah, so yeah, the, the top will come off. The two big things we want to clean is the burner and the exchange. Um, typically, if they're running properly, they can go six, seven years without, without any need for cleaning them off. But, so the problem is when you get to that year six, year seven, when you do have to clean it, it's much more difficult. It's much more lengthy. You could have other parts fail because of it. So that's where the issue is that it may be the contract with the oil and the oil and the oil. It is a must. It is 100% must. I think even if it's not a Camus, it could be other manufacturers. Any game, any, I see any more than more Camus. Any boiler, I think you have to make sure you clean it once a year. That's, that's very important. And just, just make sure it's running the way it's supposed to. The three big things to touch on is cleaning the burner, cleaning the exchanger, and then doing a combustion analysis of low and high fire. Exactly. Because if you clean the burner and the exchanger and your combustion is way off, then you'd be back here in a couple months. So that would be a the process. Sorry? It will be an easy process to do all that. Yeah, and you're looking at typically per per boiler about maybe three or four hours. Okay. We have an all inclusive with Johnson, so they should take care of that part. Yeah, and Johnson's great at that. Johnson's very good at that. Okay, the other thing that I go boiler room, then you see water on the floor. Okay, so what we should do is it something that we have to pick up right away. Yeah, no, well, no. well it, it's, it all depends on the severity of the lake, okay. right? Because okay. the biggest thing is we need to determine where it's coming from. Because a lot of sources of water, water in this, there, right? yeah. even in this small area, it would be a bigger one in for the long run. Exactly. Usually it's condensate, uh, but it could be from the exchanger, it could be from the pump, it could be just off of the back. Or some type of lake. I think the first thing you're going to do is give the contractor a call, we'll have them have a look. Try to determine the source. If it is the boiler, especially yes. within the first year or two, we're going to come out and take a look because that's okay. very abnormal. No matter what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if it is the exchanger, in which case they just yes. fail. Right, right now, if you come and do an inspection like this, would you make any deficiencies or any recommendations for the uh, installer? By looking at this, from, from a quick look, um, the biggest things that I look for is delta T and high fire, the difference between inlet and outlet temperature, that's really important to me. High flow, or the specific flow for these boilers is paramount. Uh, for longevity of life, um, but we'll see that in the startup report. So but this is not a preset thing, this is not how it's coming as a manufacturer. The boilers are all preset, but the environment is always different, right? So the pump requires the piping requirements, the venting, all of that is completely different. So you do see changes, they're all, they're all factory tested, but once they get in the field, everything needs to be tweaked, just because it's so different in every situation. Um, but we'll see that in the startup reports, and if there's any issues, then we'll, you know, we'll usually make recommendations from there. But the install looks great, okay. from what I've seen. Um, and it looks like they're running well, and we all are. It seems okay. So I think it's just, yeah, keep an eye on it. The biggest thing to do is if there is an issue, make a phone call as opposed to just trying to take a phone call again. Uh, just so there is a, a change of information, and we know what's going on. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it from the uh, superintendent building management standpoint. That's probably as far as you want to go. Um, I can show you quickly how to isolate um, away from the AS if you want. Uh, it is pretty straightforward, and you can always give us a call to do that if you find, let's say, for whatever reason, building automation just isn't working. Okay. 
Okay. Since it's sending a set point, it could be wrong. It could be sending something too low. Okay. So if you're going to do that, um, well, you're the first, thing you're, oh, oh, first thing you're going to do is you're going to change your remote setting to locus. So now demand will come from the boiler as opposed to from this is to remove a GAS so to remove building automation, we have a remote local switch here. That just switch, we flip that to local. So now you eliminate any uh, PS uh, yes, reaction. Now they're not able to control the demand. The demand will completely come from these set points. Um, and then the only thing, the only other thing we need to change as well is they're sending a set point in terms of modulation control. So we want to get rid of that. So we go into configure. So the best way to do it, if you want to record this, so I just I configure and then just do it like a, do like a chevron. So we configure that the CH central heat. And then we've got a few submenus in here. You're just kind of moving over until we get to modulation. Um, and then we've got a modulation rate source. So the source of modulation is coming from the external. It says S2, it's kind of just jargon. But saying, realistically, I don't see any of us trying to get that into program. You put this up in this room. It is simple as, it's as simple as pressing this. Okay. Log in, SOLA. Your login password is sold. And you just change from that to local. And you say OK. And that would be completely isolated from building on the base. And now, I, I know you might not remember that. Just like we don't expect you to. I'm just giving you an idea. I never changed it. Oh, OK. No um, problem. So if you do ever need to do that, it is something It's possible. It's very simple. It's very easy to do. And anyone can do it. I can walk if everything it. fails, and you have to figure out how they work with all the DS. Exactly. So basically, it's a matter of putting the pumps in hand, which they already are. I'm not, I guess, not too yeah. sure why they are right now. It could be just until Provident does a complete change. Eventually, yeah. Um, and then you'd isolate them. And they'd be up and running on their own. Um, and I think that's it. Um, I, think that, I think that would be it. It might be worth checking the neutralizers from time to time, but that's again, that should be for the maintenance here the contract. Because these are non condensing, but you will see uh, condensate coming from the bed from time to time. Right now, I guess they've removed it so they can paint. Okay. And they'll probably be put back. It looks like it was hooked up right there. Right, okay. yeah. So that's that's a good size for the free boiler. It's not like a size or anything like that. Yeah. 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 Is it possible for the boiler to the boiler will run at the same time? Yeah, you can have all three running at the same time. It's possible. Uh, it's unlikely. Like the uh, higher demand. Yeah, so let's say this also does domestic hot water, right? So it could be a really cold day and it could be first thing in the morning. So everybody's having showers and it's minus 20 outside. So there's a lot of demand. How much heat is required to build energy? Right, because it's going um, and a lot of these newer buildings, there's a lot of redundancy designed in. So I bet you more than likely only two out of three will fire any given time. Um, I, I think it'd be very rare to have all three. Yeah, I have heard it too. Just one. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it'll be unlikely, but it'll happen for sure. That'll be normal. Even if three go, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. The automation is determined if that was required. Do you guys have any other questions? Uh, I missed your last yeah. one, like how you said, like press the configure button and then you go to the CHP and then you go to the SOLA. I missed the last one. Oh, okay. So that's so you want to configure the central heat and then you, it's underneath modulation, which yeah. is a header. And then it's, you're changing modulation rates or more. Yeah. It's really lovely. So you can say change modulation rates for us. So you can do that too by changing the set point. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can make the, you can do everything in there. Yeah, so the only thing you need to 
the password for it, so it changes that one. So you can go right into the phone and change the password. Yeah, you just press it, put it to where you need it, and say OK. You should probably shouldn't have to make any changes uh, because it is constant. Um, but if you do, that's where you work. I think we only can have one that's all I have for right okay. now. Then that's all I got for you. Rooms and inside they're too hot, usually it's too cold. Okay. Yeah. What is recommended by code okay. is from one meter and above, right. it needs to be at least 10 degrees Celsius. Okay. Right? Um, as far as going hot, it'll never get hot enough because okay. even if the generator runs, the vents will open up okay. and uh, we'll get So what, what do you expect from the super when, or management? Louvers off? And the temperature over yeah. the winter get over 10 uh, Celsius? Uh, basically, uh, above your waist, okay. it needs to be above. So you walk into the room, if you feel like it's extremely cold, cold you know, you don't have to sit with the temperature with the temperature gauge. You feel it's extremely cold, put the heat up a little bit just to, to make sure. Uh, the average, most of the buildings, like I'm going to give you a perspective of what they're doing most of the building. They keep it anywhere between 16, 15 to 16 degrees Celsius because you gotta give a little play. These are brand new. Once they start to age a little bit, you might what get a little bit more drop inside, drop. right? Um, the first thing that we do before anything, give it to all your monitoring company, put the system on test, yeah, right? Uh, once you come in here, you have to check to make sure that your generator is not automatic. You have to go on the other side. You're not going to be on the news. This is just internal for us. <laughs> I have a clean slate. I don't. It doesn't matter. So we have to make sure that that generator is in automatic before before we touch anything. The reason why is we want to make sure that the, when we come in, that the generator has been in, in the location that it's supposed to be in case there was a power failure. So before we do any work, the first thing we we'll have to do. Uh, are we first of all on service right now? Is the building on test? Oh, I don't think so, no. Okay, uh, if you can call the monitoring, because uh, sometimes what happens, usually they'll call you and they'll tell you. So that automatic is something that you expect all the time? Is that at all times. Okay. Basically what happens, if the generator is not on automatic, okay. when you do get a power failure, the generator will not start. start. So what are the two options, off or manual, or what uh, other options? You, you can put it on the manual. Once okay. you put it on the manual, then you have control over these ones. You press zero, and uh, you disable the generator completely. So you don't want to be working on the generator while but you... from our perspective, I think it's automatic is the, the word that we should see there. All yeah, the time. basically okay. automatic, what you want to see is before you come in and before you leave, that you have to remember that it's an automatic. So okay. basically, even though with, uh, with our jobs, if I forget a generator one, two times on a manual, I can lose my job. It's that important that we have, we have, uh, okay. okay? So. It's not on this yet. So okay. I'm still waiting yeah. for No problem. So Automatic we cannot... temperature, the oil heater now. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go through that. Uh, oh, you have to finish with the panel? We're just going to have to wait until we're on test. Okay. Uh, I don't want to go ahead and showing things and then we come back. Okay. It's very easy for somebody that hasn't okay. done this to get confused, okay. right? So let's do it step by step. It's going to be okay. easier. This one here, the, uh, the contact here should be... This, this one always it has to be up on top. Okay. Uh, this is the actual main cutoff breaker, right? So basically what happens is if this one is off, the power will not be distributed to the building, right? Uh, we are also using it when we do our annual. We also use this one. This is where we help up our load banks too, in order to be able to produce. This is the uh, semi annual or the annual? For the annual. For the yeah. Annual. The semi annual is basically an inspection doing the building transfer. The annual is where we do change your oil, complete inspection of generator, make sure all the fluids, everything is uh, done, and run the generator so 100%. So for weekly, do a run for half an hour? Yeah, for no five minutes, no more than five minutes. Okay, good. So, um, what you're saying for multiple reasons. Generators don't like to run dry without any load on them. So one thing, you preserve the generator if you run it 
less time, right, uh, on the weekly. If you do a transfer, if you want to run it for for a day, the whole day, or until. Uh, if I know is this is gas. That's the good thing. It's gas. Yeah, you can run it for days as long as you have load. They don't like to run without load, so keep it within a five minute. And uh, uh, the ultimate thing, if you run it twenty minutes every day. For no reason, you're just wasting fuel because although you have unlimited supply, you still gotta pay the gas bill, right? right? So, so for we, him, he will do it from the transfer switch or no? This one only the technician touch. Okay. The only thing you have to do it's a visual. You make sure that this one is on the on position. Uh, a lot of times we do get sometimes they they might trip or anything like that, and then we get the call sometimes from the customers. Uh, we got a pay. Case, I see it. You can actually lock this. Uh, it's I not recommended okay, to lock it, and so the reason why is if something goes wrong in here, well, you want to be able to. Okay. It, it needs to be able so to. So would it make sense then to have some stickers? You know what? The super might be off. The manager is not here. No one is here. It might be a cleaner that is trying to. Help. Not not allowed to come here. No one. Anyone, anyone that has been doing the training is the only people that are allowed in this room. You cannot have a cleaner uh, in here. Uh, if you do get, yeah, he has to have the training for safety because regardless what the case is, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that anyone that comes in here has had a little bit of training for their safety. Something goes wrong, um, they need to have an idea about what they have to do, so right? What do you think a sticker that this is just for a technician only would hurt to have it on? Not at all. Not at all. So Whatever it makes you feel comfortable that nobody else can touch. Uh, again, I don't recommend to have this locked because if, first of all, the only way you can lock it is so if this one is stressed. Right? We need it all on right. at all right. times, right? right. Uh, regardless, whatever the case may be, if we had can lock, right, then this would be a secondary, there would be a secondary breaker where the, we would have it off and when we needed to transfer, we'll just tur turn one breaker on, the other one off, and we hook up the generator. This particular unit does not have can lock. Uh, most likely, just ahead of time, I might let you know that our technicians most likely will recommend to put the cam locks and the reason being in the long run you will save the life of this right so there's more like an option yeah basically what happens is that once i open this uh, th this uh these um breakers they have locks on the bottom which are connected with an allen key and every time you service take off put on the off, put on eventually they wear out for cam lock yeah, all it is, um, so why you put it inside, you lock it, that those things almost never wear out. So how so, do you know what's inside? You know you've been here before, or you've done mm -hmm. the installation? How do you know what's inside? I know exactly what's inside. Oh, yeah. Every generator is the oh, yeah. same. Yeah. So There's that's a an option that maybe we want to look for? Um, we will suggest it, most likely. Uh, we come to the, to the service, no matter what, eventually a, a technician will suggest it. Okay. Uh, once we open inside, if we see usually the lugs, they're the type that wear out easily because different companies, they supply different lugs. If they, they, they're the type that wear out easily, believe me, it's sometimes it's cheaper to put a cam lock in it than to actually keep changing this over and over and over. We're talking right? here like order of... A few thousand dollars, yeah, at least. Okay, but so are we good now with the yeah. system? We're good to go? Sure. All right. You don't want to call the fire So, we'll go step by step. Uh, Would that uh, interfere with the uh, elevator? Person? Not right now, but when you do transfer, it will interfere. Uh, like I said, I cannot do the transfer today, but when we come for the service, you will have notified your tenants. We will do, with the super, we will do the transfer so he knows how to do it, right? All right. It's hot for the jacket. Yeah, it is. All right. So once we have come here, what you want to do is make sure you put your generator on manual. Right? You press off. It will not start now. No matter what the case may be, it will not start. Okay? Not in auto. So you start checking. Okay? Now you can start uh, doing the work. Okay? 
I'm going to go by what I normally check. Um, it works for me. It, it, I find it uh, more, like it saves me a little bit of time as I go. First of all, do not do anything I'm doing right now. Always have to wear glasses. I recommend to have some uh, gloves. Uh, I do this on a daily basis. I've gotten used to it. I know what to expect. Don't try to do what I'm doing. Okay. So you need to check your batteries, right? You open each one of them. Uh, you notice that water level in here? Yeah. On the bottom of it, there's a little metal plate. Yeah. You can see it. That's that true. plate it should be should be that, needs, that plate at all times needs to be covered. It's recommended where you see the level right now, it's always at that level. Okay? If you need to top them up, you cannot use regular water, you have to use distilled water. You can find that water in any supermarket. Did you check everything? You check because each and one of them. Each one, like this one here region. has its own cell. Yeah. This one here has its own cell, so each one needs to be checked individually. Uh, what you want to check on the, around the wires to make sure that you don't have any buildup of calcium. It, usually when the batteries are new, it doesn't happen. When they start to get old, right? It's again, it's a visual. You just look with your eyes, make sure there's no calcium buildup because what happens is once the calcium builds up and it gets in between the poles, you might lose a little bit of connectivity to the battery and that decreases your voltage. If it decreases enough, your generator will not start, right? Um, this is your charger related to the battery, okay? You want to see you know, the voltage, you see where the gauge is, anywhere between 28 and just below 30 is good. So, the lowest one is below, just below 30. You see it above 30, man, usually there's something uh, wrong. It's either overcharging. So like 28, 26, it's good. It's good. Even, even if it touches just barely 30, you're okay, okay? So the one on the left is your voltage gauge, right? And the, the one on the right, that's your DC, your ampere night gauge. That will not always work. Sometimes it'll, you'll see two, three amps. That's telling you that, that the batteries are being charged. Obviously, your battery level uh, voltage needs to drop enough before the charger will charge. You don't, you don't so want it charging at all time. So that coming out from here? Or? No, this one is actually feeding the batteries. Okay. Right? So, that's so the when the voltage of so the that's batteries... that's the one charging the battery. Exactly. So what happens is the, 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 the controller of the generator is always taking out the power from the battery. That's how it monitors to make sure, like it checks, communicate it. It's all communication. It communicates with the transfer switch to this let thing? it know. Yeah, that's okay. this thing here. So you always want to make sure you see where the position is? You always want to make sure it's in the on position. You also see the, the little light there. Yeah, battery. Yeah. Like uh, you see the top button where it's in the middle? This? This one? Yeah, okay. that, that one there, it needs to be in the position where it is okay. at all times. And that, this one that's the normal the same? That Yeah, that's the on and off button. Okay, so, so uh, that's the flow. Usually when it charges on the automatic, it'll decide if it wants to charge the batteries individually or if it wants, if the voltage is about the same, it'll flow charge, that means it's going to charge both batteries about the same rate. But if one battery drops a lot below, basically, it'll choose which battery needs more charge. It'll charge it up until it even, and then they'll flow. So you okay. can see the lights yeah. if both yeah. of them is charging. So yeah, right now they're being the, the batteries are charging. Uh, and again, you're not gonna see it at all times. That that go in about five minutes or 15 minutes. Sometimes I've seen these things go up to an hour because depending on the amperes that they charge. So uh, don't don't be alarmed with that. Always pay attention to the voltage. If it goes above 30, then you know there's an issue. You're overcharging or something. If it drops below 20, again you have a problem because even low voltage. Sometimes it's not going to be enough to get the generator started. So should you want to keep it around should 25, I turn it off? 20 seconds. You never turn it off. That will shut off by itself. When the battery is charged, it shuts off automatically. You don't have to touch anything. Uh, another thing you want to check is always just a light tug 
on that on these wires here once a week. Make sure nothing goes very loose or anything like that. That's your starter, by the way. That's what makes the magic happen when the power fails. Um, you want to check your oil. Okay, your oil gauge is right here. Okay, so. Your, your lines here, you want to be just, just not above this, right? So you you want to be somewhere around here, right? But this so. is no different than a car engine. They're exactly the same. Engine there. Yeah, it's you exactly the, the same. That we put the key and start. Yeah. You got the oil gauge, everything. Like Example, you see the level is right now yeah. on the camera? I like the second line. Yeah. You can be in between, like about three quarters towards the top line. But not more. Not yeah. More than if it's less, fill it up. You need to top it up. Um, if you do top it up, what? 15 W40 oil we use. But we don't you use want a regular. Us to get to touch and top it up. Pardon me? Do you want us to get involved in doing something like this with the machine? It's very fairly simple. Yes, it's up to you. If you're comfortable, uh, all it is, there's a tap, there's a tap right here with a little one liter thing, just top okay. off. If, okay. like, you understand up to where the line is, mm -hmm. you don't want to just keep pouring like 15 liters in there. Liter okay. by liter and check a little bit, just like you do with your own car. With right? your new engine, I guess that everything is tight now. So well, I would hope not to see much of you. I, I'll work. tell you, have gener some generators from the 1950s and 1960s. Yeah. And their their engine is still running like brand new. I've seen Rolls Royce engines. So we still have those two, yeah, Perkins engines and things like that. So, okay. yeah. And this is a two cell. What is this? This one. Uh, I see no, it that's a PSI. Uh, so they don't stop the two cell or. The uh, yeah, two cell. Uh, Daewoo makes two cell oh, basically. Okay. okay. Your. Cool, eh? so up here, I'm not going to ask you guys to come up here. Uh, the super, usually, you can check from here. Yeah. You have the little gates here. Make sure that this one, now that your generator is new, you don't have that issue. You can always check. Once they get old, older, they, these ones, they, they have the tendency to get a little bit of a build up there. You, will you don't see it. Usually, when we do our service, if we see things like that, we open up, take out the coolant, open them up, clean them out, right? But uh, in, in case, you can crack it open from here. What happens is your your engine has a block heater and your engine stays warm at all times. So even when you open the top, uh, have a little rag, you're not gonna get a spray or anything, but you're gonna notice a little bit of air coming out. So just crack it open. Let, allow the air to come out and check. What you want to check is to make sure that your coolant level is above this sensor. This is your low low uh, coolant uh, level. That's you can check that while yeah, running. You can or either, no, well, well, it's not running. Okay. You can see from here, or you can open it from the top, whichever one's your preference. As a technician, we always like to the, the top. That can fail you. That will not. There should be an alarm. I see that that's what I Yeah, this is this sensor issue. here is your low your low uh, level. Okay. Right. So that's why you want the coolant to be above this. As long as this one is covered, you 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 will not get an alarm. Okay. Um, a quick check of the fence to make sure that uh, you don't have any excessive buildup on the radiator fence. Um, Lucky your block heater, you want to make sure that you don't get any leaks from here down again. Uh, guys, it's common in common sense. Thank, thank God with this plan we have gravity, everything goes to the floor. So you take a look on the floor, make sure that, that there's no coolant, uh, any coolant on the floor. Same thing goes with oil. You make sure that there's no oil on the floor, right? Uh, you want to check all the hoses around here. Again, it's a quick visual. You don't like sit, take your time, a quick visual, make sure there's no drips or anything like that anywhere around where the radiator hoses are connected. This you don't touch, this is live in here, okay? This is your relay box for your block heater. So it's that, locked, I guess it's locked. It's, it's locked, uh, okay, so it's be... locked, it's supposed to be locked at all times. Again, the lock, a little screwdriver can open it. 
do not put it's live in there. So uh, depends. I will let you know right now. Yeah. 240. So you have two sources connected to that. If we can go over to the other side now. Although what you wanna be doing is you wanna this is your oil filter guys. Uh, you would just basically want to see, make sure that there's no leakage there. Uh, you don't necessarily need, you, like you look at it at first, but you, it's usually like right now, it will not leak. Once you get the generator running, the stereo is still there. Why is not covered? Mm -hmm. uh, not all filters need to be covered. Uh, basically what happens, dirty air goes through here, that it gets filtered by the, this little fence to make sure that the air goes in. Depending on the company, some they might have a, like a partial cover, but it cannot be covered completely, otherwise so you're not, not going to have air. So that has to be changed every six months? or No, so, uh, some of these filters I have, sometimes they'll last like uh, years. They don't, they don't... Do you blow it once a year when it comes? Uh, yeah, we, we just lightly service them. Uh, they, you'll be surprised how long these things last. It's not one of those things you need to change annually. We will. Yeah. Anything that's related to the generator, you don't have to worry. We, when we come on our services, we'll let you know, like, like if your batteries are starting to go or they're outdated and everything, oh. we'll let you know on all these things. All you have to worry is to make sure that, that you have a technician coming up here. It doesn't matter if it's Ronnie's or if it's any other company. Bottom line is, when the time comes, we will let you know if something needs fixed. Uh, one thing with Ronnie's. We don't, we're not eager to push to get, to, for you guys to keep buying parts. So and then we if, give you for if, a second opinion, you are the one that okay. ought to, to review a quotation from someone else. Yep, we you can, you can by all means, like I said, uh, Ronnie is the one thing that would, unless he needs it, we don't push, you know, we don't try to make my money from parts. You if you need to have it. For emergency, let's say tonight there is a problem, I will you give, know, uh, I will give you uh, my number. I will give you my number. Okay. Uh, if you, in case you have any problem or anything, you can call me. And then, uh, if it's a situation where a service call is needed, I will guide you over uh, through that. I'll give you a business card that, that has our uh, phone number. Here, so yeah. You get overnight. No one, no better. This will this night If you call that number. 24 hours, so even when our office is closed, it goes directly to our on call uh, line. So we have, uh, it's not the technician, we have a hotline. So it'll, it'll forward oh, to that. It's an the, system. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah and then no we'll call whomever it's on call. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, we're not going to try right away to, to, to come. Basically, we'll, we'll guide the super on uh, if there's some things that we're going to get them to try, right? Uh, the reason being is. It's not fair to you guys for us to come here, press a button, you just paid us a few hours for no reason, right? So we try to do whatever we can to help you out, and then if there's no other choice, then we'll come in, okay? So again, like I said, the filter, we gotta make sure that there's no leaks. Again, it's a visual inspection. When the generator's running, these are your uh, oil sensors and centers. Basically what you wanna do is, when the generator's running, make sure, like especially this top one here, mm -hmm. when they get old, they have a tendency to get a little bit of a leak. Not a major thing. Again, you'll see it on the floor, but uh, keep an eye on this one every time the generator's uh, running, because if they get old, like I said, they have a tendency to leak. They, they start uh, leaking from around here. So if it's leaking, let us know, and we'll come and change. That's pretty much. So as for you to do this once a month, we will go here and start from here. Once a week. Once a week. Yeah. So, so about the transfer, we will schedule it. Uh, the transfer, what we'll do is the next time we're gonna come to do um, the, the service because between me and you, it's not worth it for for us to reschedule to come here for no reason to just show you how to transfer. These louvers, so you will see the top one there. These are thermal. Uh, uh, temperature controlled. So even these ones, I see that you have a temperature controlled. So don't be surprised sometimes if you come in here and it's really hot outside and then you see them a crack open. They measure the temperature of the room and they'll adjust the temperature by opening and closing. 
So if, it, if it's too hot in here, they'll open up, allow some air, some temperature to come in. Because again, even in the summer, you have the block heaters running, the engine gets warmed up. In the summertime, you might heat up, depending if you have air conditioning on this room or not, right? So don't be alarmed with the things. The only thing you want to make sure that you have, once you start it, they start to open up, at least part of them. Sometimes, I don't know how they, they have to set up. What happens sometimes, when they're in temperature control, you might get the half of them to open up when the generator starts. It's too cold outside. Right? Yeah, and then if, it, if it's too hot, for instance, we'll then off. the next one will temperature adjust to bring that temperature in. So these are automatic? Yes. These are automatic, completely so automatic. So basically, that controls, their controls uh, right there. That will control at one temperature, so at about 20 degrees, then they get a step down. Okay, maybe stickers on those and the set point, or maybe we should mark it with a marker to make sure that we uh, start playing with them. You could mark it as long as you remember anywhere, like that's a little bit too high, I, I would say, I would keep it around here. Would you call it for uh, hotter and colder? Let's see if those would open. Mm -hmm. If you call it now for uh, five or something, or maybe for it's, like 20 in something. In time, it'll, 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 it'll make a difference, okay. right? But if we do it right now, 25, you would expect to see them open, yeah? That's your bet, actually. Yeah. So that's the, that's the other one. Yeah. Okay. 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 So you're gonna, oh, that's your bet there. So this everything is controlled in the controller. Yeah, basically you run this one. It so there yeah. is no temperature control for this? Okay. They're, they're controlled inside. Oh, it's inside. Oh. Yeah. All right, so at this point, you want to start the generator. Okay. So it's on manual, is it? Well, it's up to you guys. It's going to be very loud. If okay, you so you have to your get ears. the uh, earplugs. I mean, it's an engine of the other well, it's not a normal engine, it's loud. It's loud. Create 60 hertz. All, all generators need to be running around 1800 RPMs. It could be off by one or two RPMs, up or down, but give or take, it's all 1800. So 1800 RPMs will get you 60 hertz. So speed here, depending on how they have it set up inside the controller, you might either get 1800 RPMs or 60 hertz. Some some controllers, they might have to hold. 6.2 is okay. You, you get yeah, yeah, it, you, you want to keep it to 61. Fair. You want. Even 61, if there's a percentage, even 61, if you see it's 63 and now, then you gotta let us know because then at that point, you're starting to cause damage in the equipment when it's starting. If you see it 56, 55, you let us know when the generator does not start. Because if you have over speed or, or under speed, uh, it's already set up to shut up by itself. So, Usually you don't have to worry about it. But if you see that it's running and it's not shutting up, could be one of the sensors that's that's supposed to be controlling the over speed or the under speed, right? Which might not be working. So let us know if you see like five or six uh, hertz uh, over or under. That usually is recommended to let us know. So yeah. Your battery voltage, you can see here, like I was telling you. So whatever you see here, you can now wanna, it needs to be give or take. It's not gonna be accurate from one to the other because the gauge might respond somewhere, but you wanna make sure at least within a couple of volts up or down, they kinda somewhat match, right? Uh, your oil, when your generator is running, you're gonna have some oil pressure. The average is give or take about 80, from, from a hydrant to, depending how the engine warms up, as the engine warms up, the BSI drops. So, up to as low as 40, 42 BSI, you're good. Again, it has a sensor. If something goes wrong, it will shut up by itself. But 
give or take, you'll, you'll notice that your PSI levels will be in average around 50 to 60. Okay. Well, uh, one question. Yeah. If the power goes on, this will automatically... Automatically. You don't have to and come running And how the power is going Then it will automatically shut, shut up down. by itself. That's, the, the, that's being controlled by the transmission switch. Okay. okay. So, uh, the coolant, that's your temperature of the coolant. When the generator runs, it's going to be higher, right? So when you have it running, give or take, you don't want it to pass 205. It's a natural gas unit, so you can go up to 205 to 210 safely. Diesel engines don't like it. You want to keep it below uh, 200 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Uh, it has a sensor again. It will shut up by itself if it overheats. I'm just telling you on what you want to keep an eye out. If you see it's 210, 215, but it's not shutting up. Maybe a sensor is not reading. It's always still, like they say, computers can make a mistake. The brain does never, it never makes a mistake, right? Current, that's your average. Only when you do a transfer will you have current in this thing. If you don't do transfer, yeah. You'll, you'll have voltage, but you will have no amperage. Your voltage, line one to neutral. It's, uh, is it 600 volt unit? Let's say it's a 600 volt, I haven't checked. Let's say it's a 600 volt unit, right? You will have 347 volts. Okay, uh, basically, a 600 uh, to neutral is 347, people yeah. think about half. Yeah. So uh, line to line you will have give or take about six hundred with generators it can flash three. Yeah, depending on the generator. I've seen generators go as, as far as six or three, six or five, six or seven, right? Uh, so Line one to two, line two to three, line three to one back again. That's how they measure. Like you have three lines, right? So you you measure between this line and this line, from this line to this line to this line, your voltage. You don't need to worry about that. I'm just giving you a rough idea of how it works, right? That's for us to worry about. Uh, these ones, you don't worry. Your frequency is that one thing that you want to check. Uh, for E has to be around 60. 59, 61, 61 and a half, you're okay, right? Uh, run time, you always, you always want to record it on your log. So usually whatever the log is asking you for, you find it in here and you usually they ask you for voltage, amperage if you have that transfer. Uh, if not, you gotta write zero, right? They'll ask you for temperature, they'll ask you sometimes for Block heater to, to see if the block heater works or if there's any leaks and things like that. So, common stuff. Anything that I ask you, you'll find it in here. And from this point on, all the rest, it's for us to worry about. Okay? You lose your, your bathroom exhaust. The, exhaust. You don't, you don't have, the unit model type that you have here is a two pipe fan coil with electric heat. Okay, so you've got, right now, you've got hot water, we were just up there, you got the boilers running. So, these units at the fan coils, you're going to have, uh, we saw the temps for what, 170? 160. 160? 160. So you've probably got around 160 coming to the fan coil unit, uh, hot water temperature, which is fine. That's the design uh, temps for that. Um, now, you have to do the seasonal changeover. So right now, the occupant is only going to have heat option. Um, come, let's say, April, May, when you do the system changeover, they now have the option of cooling. Once you got the chiller is on. chilled water, the chiller's on and everything. And you also have an auxiliary electric heater. So that is for, let's say, in April, you decide to do a changeover, and it gets relatively cold one night, mm -hmm. and somebody needs a little bit of heat. You've got that one or one and a half kilowatt heater that'll provide a little bit of heat, just on those kind of cool shoulder season. Shoulder season. No boiler, no heat. Correct. No yeah, so water. it should typically only run on the shoulder season. Uh, otherwise, it'll be your primary heat, which is your water coil. Okay. So uh, the lower section here, you've got this is for a technician, um, basically to turn off the unit. You've also got the main breaker.
that will kill power to the unit. And you can see here, this turned off everything. So HRV and FACWELL. Um, if you look down here, uh, you've got your two isolating balls, uh, isolating ball valves, uh, your supply and your return. You got your three-way motorized valve and your actuator. So on call for heat or cool, um, if you're ever, uh, I'm not sure if you guys get into these. Do you ever get inside to look at these fan coils when there's, or somebody says you there's know, no. If someone calls, the first thing yeah. you, you might want even to buy some of the actuators. It's so easy to take it off. And Correct. Yeah, on. that could be one of your. At some point, uh, this time it's all under warranty. That's right. Year, yeah. One year. Yeah. So your, your actuator here is basically going to press down. You're going to see this stem press down, mm -hmm. and then now you know that you've got water flowing through so the that's port. either on or off? On or off valve. And it's all uh, controlled by the thermostat. So Correct. The thermostat said, turn yep. it on, heat there, everything goes through the coil. We'll the go blower. through the cycle once you... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so there's nothing much here just to know that there is that actuator there. And your yeah. isolating valves if you ever if need to you turn need to water off. If you need to remove the unit from yeah. there. You're and the filter... Yeah. It's at the bottom there. So the, in, in terms of a, an occupant, their maintenance or what they'd have to be doing is strictly filter. Mm -hmm. It's the fan coil filter because uh, like you can see these, these white panels basically hinge open. They take them out. They are not to remove any of these panels and get into here. Okay, that's got to be a uh, service technician or once you get a maintenance contract set up, um, you will be going into the unit doing any type of work like this. The unit also has... Um, sensor. I would like to try to take this out without making too much dust. Or you can just get your camera in there and look on the bottom. There's an overflow switch on the drain pan. It's like a safety and security. Correct. We'll turn everything off. And so what it does is if there's any sort of blockage in the, the drain pan. pan, the float will catch it. It's on the right, right? So you're right, on the bottom, right on the bottom right of the pan. So it's a so great just safety clip feature. onto the pan there, mm -hmm. the bottom right there. It's got like a little white float. And so that'll isolate the valve and the plumbing. So you do not have um, any more. Yeah, sure. It's just uh, on the bottom right, you see it clipped onto the pan. Just the bottom right, there's like a little. Okay. Could that come off with the vibration and all this? Is that no. something that we should no, no, be aware of? It's, it's clipped on there, and if it's still on there now, mm -hmm. think about when this unit was installed. Mm -hmm. It's there, it's not going anywhere now. Yeah. Okay. It, it's not going to vibrate off. So that float switch will turn off the water and prevents further condensation from filling the pan. Water would over, would typically would overflow and start to come out. So it's, it's one added feature that you know, they're starting to specify more. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one item to look for if there's any service issues. You could check the pan, see if that is actually overflowing, because it will turn the unit off. So we no longer have air conditioning. When that happens, somebody has to come and address this that. This is all in the uh, cooling mm -hmm. season where you have the condensate. Only in the cooling. Yeah. Okay. That'll only be in the cooling. Okay. Hmm? Okay. For so the now the okay. other section here. Let's get to this. So here's your here's your fan coil filter. Um, so fan coil and everything heating and cooling at the bottom. On the top you have the ERV. Correct. Now the filter we recommend um, semi annually changing the filter. So basically at your your changeover seasons. Um, you know, if you're doing any construction or anything like this, you know, I would change this filter now. Um, just because it, it'll pick up the debris a lot quicker. It's a relatively good filter. Make, yeah, make a note, we have to ask them. I mean, even the unit like this with so much dust, someone moves in. Mm -hmm. Say that the filter is totally blocked. I mean, I hope that there is someone that could do this. Well, what could happen is you, you might get in some, some service calls saying my unit's loud, or it's whistling, or it's vibrating. It could be because you have a plugged filter. It's trying to pull the air in, but it can't. So, so you know, you could get like all kinds of uh, interesting sounds. And so there's the core. So there's your HRV unit. So this is only service, uh, like I said, by a technician or a maintenance contract, whoever you have set up. Um, and so a few things to look for here. You've got, okay, so this filter here. Yeah. It's all plugged. Yeah, it's plugged. Yeah, but this is a washable filter, so you can just. Is it? Uh, okay, but yeah. how you expect you to have any idea? No, this, of mm -hmm. no this vacuum. 
No, this is a mirror filter. No, it's not. It's not a mirror. It's, it's not covered. washable. Sorry. It's covered. It, the dust is making it look like oh, okay. So it's like a, a pleated filter. It's not. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you it's, want to vacuum it or what? Correct. Yeah. So both the core okay. and the filter are vacuumed. Okay. So we okay. Have and so you've got the instructions right on here, right? So you once a year the for the core, and you might need to do a few times a year for the filters. So for this one, you guys or the contractor have to come in here to vacuum those out because the owner can't get back there, right? They, they no, well, it's not going to be. Uh, it's not, they don't it's do not climate tech. Well, not you. But yeah, yeah. The... Twice a year, what they would do will replace exactly. the, the filter and mm-hmm. check the drip pan, make sure that everything is clear. They would vacuum inside. They would vacuum those two, the yep. top the and the core. They, and they, they slide out the, relatively easy, right? It's there is straight. a blue. Can you open up to show the blue core there? Inside? Yeah. Sure. Two. Oh, we lost the super? Uh, he just had to quickly let the delivery in. So I could still see through it, so that's good. That's a good thing, okay. Yeah. So the contractor comes twice a year to, ch- to vacuum, change these filters, Correct. but throughout the year, yes. what I'm familiar with is owners can come into the office and purchase filters because mm-hmm. they're supposed to be changed more than twice a year, right? If they wish to purchase extra and yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's entirely up to the owner. Okay. Right? Okay. I mean, you can Don't change your... touch this. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're not to be going into any of this section here. Uh, the the fan cool filters, yeah, obviously you know you can change it four times a year if you like. Okay. Or you know if if you're not doing heavy heavy construction, you could probably get away with twice. But I would say that the other the other underlying issue here is that you, you got to remember you have a fan that's running twenty four seven. Mm-hmm. So the chances of your the chances of your filters getting plugged. It's going gonna, it's gonna to occur a lot faster. Yeah. Okay, so typically where you have a unit that turns off uh, for a few hours during the day, it's not pulling in the air. This is running 24-7. So this is plugged. Because, I mean, uh, this, for example, this unit hasn't even moved in, and that's, that's, that's right. the way it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just because there was all this construction going on, right? Yeah, yeah like you got sand, like people come in here and they're sanding, yeah. and this thing is running. Yes. So it's fine. I mean, the filter's going to catch it, but then when somebody moves in... But look, even you went through, you see the dust yeah. there? Yeah, you got it all over the uh, the coil there. So I should probably let them know. It should be part the of the cleaning, no? Should be part, they should vacuum inside and change the filter. So do you and want to... Uh, the, the, the 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 I'm going to run it through the operation now. You can... Because everybody that lives here lives probably like that. And, um, you know, like, like we had said, the... Uh, the, the biggest issue with these units is that, you know what, I'm going to close it all up, I'll, I'll turn it on and we can listen to it, but, you know, if somebody says if they can't sleep and then they want to turn it off. I so th- you have two fans here, one at the bottom, one at the top, one for the ERV, and you have the other one for the fan above. Yeah, because that is, um, residents have been saying that they don't like how that runs 24-7. I know. Yeah, this but is meant to be like this. Well, what will happen is like if you had a switch that you can turn everything off, Everybody would turn, turn off their unit, and you're no longer bringing in fresh air to the building. Yeah, because the like Delterra zero. said that a part of, I think Gino said a part of the new building code is they have that's to be correct. Yes. constantly that's running. That's how you get yeah, the fresh air. That's TV correct. TV. As long as the engineer is okay, we, just to be very, like, if you want to put in a switch, it's possible, but then it's going to be more work. Yeah. Someone will have to come here, change the wiring and everything. Mm-hmm. So it's like over and above. But now, again, you're going against the building codes and everything. Yeah. Yeah. We, will, we will do what we are told to do, as long as someone you know, carries so the task. The design and engineer would specify the CFI of fresh air in the unit, since you're not bringing that much from the hallways. That's right. Yes. Around the, 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 the frame and the door. You have to bring it from outside. That's why you need the air. So it's been designed to be like this. Then, I mean, worst comes to worst, they will probably turn that on. The plate of this unit, there's a sensor. Mm-hmm. Okay. That sensor is to, if, if the sweep is getting too cold, for whatever reason, somebody's left, they turn the unit off. No, you open this, but they smoke overnight and leave it open. So maybe you, you have should to... not, and during the winter time, I, I think you guys actually go around and put stickers yes. on our panel yeah, yeah. saying, do, do not, not leave the balcony door open during the winter, mm-hmm. as you could freeze the coil, mm-hmm. cause uh, water damage, all that stuff there. Yeah, because so do you have a sensor? There is a sensor. If okay. you want to take a picture or take a video of it, 
see these these two wires right here? Those I thought they go down to the pen. There's, There's two, two sensors. sensors. Oh, okay. okay. I want to take the filter out. Okay. So we should probably get a look around the machine and see if they can come in one. Like they can just come in one. Yeah. Was the which was what was the? That has to be changed, replaced. So I think we should tell them that they. That's gross. Well, let's take a picture of this and show it to me. You know, one more reason why it's like that, is, and the, even the makeup air unit, the filter, it's, it's the same thing like this now. But makeup air unit now is with Johnson, okay? It's all there. So they have to replace So this. now you can see better here. You got, your, you got your two devices. You got so your low front of the switch, switch. And, wait, no. and the other sensor so is screwed. It's a sensor screw. Uh, on top of that, this one is connected to every unit. Oh, that one's a cross and defrost cycle too. But that's where you take it. Technical it will do by itself. Nobody has to do anything. Okay. The HRV unit, like, because you got you got a pressure detection right, right there, right. going right okay. in there. Right. So if it's minus 20 out there, there's there's a sensor in there. And there's a, there's a spring closed damper. Okay. If it senses anything close to zero, okay. you shut off the fresh air from okay. outside. And it's going to do that throughout the night. Okay. To make sure that the air, once the air passes through the core, because of how it, it travels right, through, right. it passes through, it's, it's maintaining around a plus seven Celsius coming okay. out of the core. So what will happen will continue to recirculate the air inside. Correct. One bring the one from it does outside. Not bring it in outside air. Hot and cold. Okay. So yeah. I'm gonna go try to get a hold of that unit. Yes. That, that would hot. make sense. We can do two things. Well, they have to. That's one thing. It's you know what? I, I don't think that you want to put it back. I would just leave, leave it, it out and just leave the fine coil shut. Leave oh. it off like this. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'll add. Yeah, in case ahead. that's le leaking, do not open the front panel to close the valves because you can burn yourself, especially in hot tap water. Yeah, I mean... Uh, Just close the riser valves. That's mm. something that you guys would normally... Shut, shut it up. This one? Shut well, this one off? No, you don't want to necessarily... If, if there's water coming out onto a floor or whatever... It might be the, the pan not necessary. What should I do you, then? You probably... I mean... If you're comfortable with working with this type of equipment, mm -hmm. you can go in there and turn off the ball valves. Okay. But this is 160 it's CSI? No, no, water temperature. Temperature? So you'll, you'll burn your hands. But yeah. usually when you see water on the floor, it's not that. It's the no, fans. and it's probably, if you see water here, mm -hmm. it could even be coming from somewhere else. So, not yeah. this. so like you have maybe a riser that you want to turn off. Okay. So Which is like... So you should have to isolate this fine color riser. So this one is riser 13, R yeah, R13. Yeah, you should be, be familiar with your risers. Where yeah. are the shutoffs it's for in the, each it's riser? It's in 10th floor. We walked with Primo for that. Yeah, I know, and yeah. I I, uh, I was with them when when they're marking. Sure, yeah. but for that maintenance. No, no. With two pumps, <laughs> you have a 600 volt control panel, a 120 volt alarm panel, which is wired to your BAS. Okay. And you have, it's all run by a four float automatic system. So the way it works is from the bottom, float one is your stop float, float two is your start, float three is your boost, and float four is your high level, which goes to this, the high level. In order for the system to activate, float one and two both got to be up. And then one pump will kick in. And then it'll shut off, and then the next cycle, the second pump will kick in. It'll always alternate. Okay. So one pump's not doing the full load. For some reason, the pumps don't fail. If, if they fail, float four will tip up, and then it'll send a signal to your alarm, which sends you a signal to your BAS. So in here, you have overloads. These are your manual motor starters. And your pumps are rated for 2.1 amps. So at all times, you have to make sure this little dial here is at 2 or 2.1. Never crank it higher, because then you take away your protection from the pump. And another thing, if these are your, um, your fuses. The first fuse is for your control center. These are all for your lights and switches. So for some reason, if you have no power on your lights or your controls, you check this fuse. These two are your incoming power that protects the transformer. And basically, it's pretty much straightforward. Maintenance-wise, every three to five months, we recommend you drain the pit. Take a look at the bottom to see if there's any debris buildup manually. Yeah. To do that, you put it on hand. Sorry. To drain yeah, the pump by, by hand. Yeah. Yeah. 
But you cannot bring the water below the pump. Because if you suck up air, Overhead. you're going to clog your line. And that's uh, pretty much straightforward. So Will it any be possible to overheat the pump? Overheat? Yeah, if you're running dry. If you leave it on hand and walk away, the pump will just run until it burns up. So how, how long it needs to? I, I don't know exactly how long, but this is only for servicing the pump. So you never turn it on hand and walk away. Always okay. keep an eye on the water level to make sure it doesn't go below the pump. So like, will this be unscrewed when you're doing what you're supposed to do? Pardon me? Will this be? <coughs> Those come off. Yeah. So if you're always using the hand option, it's always better to keep an eye on the water level. Okay. If you can turn it on quickly just to hear the pump run and off, but I wouldn't let it run for more than 30 seconds. Okay. Then you run a risk of creating air pocket. Right. That goes you, for everything. Pardon me? That goes for yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> so is there any... So when my guys come in and do maintenance, yes. now just, just just curious here, yep. would you say, no, you say every three to five months you're going to drain the whole pit down? Just recommend just to check the debris. Because so it, it would be fair assessment that uh, every once in a while, we'll say, let's just say twice a year, yep. that they pull this up and have a look to see where the level's at. If the level's low mm -hmm. at the bottom float, and I know how the floats work, yeah, so okay. if, they're at, if it's at the bottom float, would you not assume that everything's working fine at that time and they can actually visibly? Well, it all depends. If you start tripping these, if these start tripping, yeah. that means your pump's picking up debris. Yeah. 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 yeah, fair enough. Yeah, so. So would the, would, is it a fair assessment to say that when they clean the parking garage, mm -hmm. right, that the pits get cleaned as well at the same time? Well, yeah. The catch base is supposed to collect most of it, but if it does pass through, it ends up in there. The, the reason I'm, I'm asking is because yeah. usually what happens is that they, they start at the, well, this is only one level too, right? But say yeah. in some instances, they're, they're putting all this, you know, the silica from mm -hmm. the concrete gets down there, gets down to the pit. They yeah. use these pumps to actually pump the pits out, right? And then they come in at the end. But yet, a month later, I lose seals because that silica eats away at the seal in the pumps, right? Yeah, So because yeah, they're ceramic seals, so the debris wears uh, and tears. I get it. So yes. I'm still trying to convince everybody that they should put an mm -hmm. actual T there. And when these guys come in to do the power washing, mm -hmm. right, that they should, they should use their own little pump, pump it down there and pump it up themselves. Oh, I think it's a temporary pump to get well, rid of it. They're doing the whole job. They should finish the job instead of using the building well, pumps. What they right? do here is they use a back truck. There's the little back truck. They suck all the shit out. Yeah, only at the end though, but the, any water's from the power washing and everything else. Yeah, after you done washing, it's all going to end up there. Yeah. yeah. You get the back truck. I'm just, make, I'm just saying this in front of you, so when I come to you and you say you needed one because, uh, you know, you need a new pump because the seal's gone on it. Mm -hmm. And it usually happens a month or two months after the, they do the power washing. That's when, that's when yeah. I normally yeah. see it. Now, the, 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 the floats, yeah. are the floats all attached to the inside wall of the, uh, the, the sun? Wall. Either on the discharge there's pipe a steel, or there's, there's a, a special steel. rod. Yeah. It's a separate. They're separate? Yes. And they use the gear clamp, stainless steel gear clamp, they use a plastic. They should have six inches. Excellent. You said, I know exactly what As soon as you say the gear clamp and you say that if yeah. you use a PVC, that all works for me. I know exactly what you're You don't want to go in there with the shit inside. So you well, it's like you're going to do it right the first time. Yeah, exactly. Because we end up trying to sell it after, saying if you put a float <coughs> in, we get to pull it out. Don't want to go down to the fifth. And nobody gets and there's also no. straps in here. So if you ever do got to pull it, there's a couple old okay. straps. So just, uh, well, here we didn't need a shot. Those ones there, there's one in there. These, are, these, these you can light. pull off. We, we so. can do that. Yeah, we use brass pump. unions on these ones. It's just a pain in the rear end when you get, you know, we're, we've got so much safety at our, our company too that, yeah. you know, if we need to get confined space and you got to get a crew here, a rescue crew, no, all that's a, like, holy yeah, mackerel. The really only don't. one you might need is that one there. But, but, if, the but if all the attachments are there, that's cool. Okay. Only this shot, over there you have it. These ones here you can literally pull them Pull, pull yeah, all by hand? They're half horsepower, so they're not. Oh, no. You controls. The, the set point pressure, there's, there's sensors on either side, so you get city water coming in, mm -hmm. set point pressure will go out of the roof. Okay. And what it'll do is fluctuate the two pumps, whatever's the most electronic or electrical efficient. Mm -hmm. So you may get one running, and then the second one comes on, and it'll both slow down. The CPU controls this to, to maintain it at the set point pressure for the most efficient point. Okay. The ramping up and down. Uh, this, when we did the setup, the um, set point pressure was at 100 psi. 70% of the set point is this is the charge too. 
So it's been charged, it's running. What that does is, it, it, somebody flushes the toilet on the 13th floor, mm -hmm. the pump isn't charged. So it, it's a draw down the tank for the system. And it stops any possible pipe line. Mm -hmm. The pump's going on and off, on and off. And we on. love it. We like the system. I, I like it. It's very simple, it's, yeah. it's smooth. There's zero maintenance to it. Other I like than it too because it's separate. So I can put this anywhere I want. Yeah. Which is, this room is decent. It's downtown where it's tight, TPA. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you're in the parking lot. This is the biggest. Yeah. 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 One this of the biggest things we're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We got a whole lot. Oh, oh, You can manually ramp up and ramp down. No, the, the way it's set up now is it's on its own. Uh, ramping it up and down, you can adjust the pressures, but you can't ramp them up and down physically. Okay. Circulate the smaller ones you can. Just push a button. You can speed it up This is all CPU. CPU control. The control system is. Yeah, so you're on it. You can get away. I'm just going to show them. That's a fire pump. Okay. I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them. I'm going so it changes. You can go oh, back and forth. It's not for school. 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 It automatically changes from, from lead to lag every time the pump stops. So you don't get one the first time more that faster than the other. You get two four times. And it will show you what it's been doing, what the set point pressure is. And you can adjust the set point pressure. I don't suggest you do it at this point. You can get complaints. When we sign it, water pressure? Get the plates on the roof, some of us can tell The water pressure here isn't that high. You see a green. Do you think? Alright, so when you say the water pressure is high, that's why they want Is that normal? In here? So, that's why I want to ask. Because the water pressure is in this unit. You need to wash your hands. The water pressure that comes out of the sink, like it's there, it's decent, but it's not, like, for example, in my house. We just did it as per the engineer. Sorry to interrupt. You have low flow faucets here. Yeah, okay, that's what I'm asking. So it's you supposed have, to be your like that. Your faucets are 0. 0.5 GPM, which mm -hmm. is nothing. Yeah, and they're supposed they're to be. garbage. Yes, yeah. that's a Wow. I don't like it. Because, like, for example, if I wash my hands, let's say, uh, like in his unit, it's not the same sink as my house. No, yeah, so it's like his sink is the same as the sink in 10th floor, it's the same as 15, same as 5. It's all 0.5. When they do it, they save money. Okay. And the toilets, they're even worse. The reason why there's so many problems now is because there's so little water flushing the toilet. Okay. That's the problem. It should be green. So back in the day, you used to have 13 liters flushing the pipe, cleaning the pipe. Now you have 4.8 liters. Oh. Green. So you went, it's dark. It doesn't move everything. But it is intentionally set that way. Yeah. Okay. It's where it is. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. I know, I know that. One thing I would suggest to you is I would get some uh, magic marker. I know it doesn't look aesthetic, but I think it's a good idea. let him write down what valve, what's here. It's in there, yeah. yeah go ahead. Clean out. You can even get lamacoids now. That's why I want. I want to have all the. I want to have all the cases, and then I will start. But Don, uh, he should have gave it to you. So I handed him in. We handed him in. You should have it. I'll make a phone call out. Yeah. I'll make a phone um, call. But I need to write on whatever. The, <laughs> the boat chart and it, everything. You, you, you really didn't get them? I will say. So what do you want to know? What do you want me to say? The shout out for the risers. Okay. There. So the heating system, the, the, 
The fan coil system water lines, the supply main, is on the ground, half on ground, and half starts in P1, because there's half the suites on the, on the ground floor. So, <clears throat> on this half of the building, this is where the suites are. Okay. In each access door, there's either a valve or a clean -out. Okay. For the plumbing uh, sanitary system. Okay. They all have a valve tag on it. We even think we wrote the riser number on the insulation, so you don't have to look it up. But that's pretty much it. What I suggest is you write what's there, the suite number, that way you're covered. You don't have to worry about it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, since you're here, mm -hmm. I want to ask about the, yeah. the water access for the chutes. Water access for the garbage chute wash down? Yeah. It's on the roof. I can't reach it. What do you mean you can't reach it? I don't know. Think you can't it. find it or you can't find it? I can't find it. And then why did they install it? Why they why they install the bulb in the in the roof? Because the, uh, on the it original have, drawing... It should be in the garbage no. room itself. No. The valve is fed from the roof down. Or else you need high pressure line to reach the roof and come down. Okay, that's what I thought when you mentioned it to me. If it was on the ground floor, I was wondering how the hell do you plan on getting to this? The only way you could do that, usually what they do, is they have a light switch. And it works the solenoid valve on the roof. Mm -hmm. You hit that and wash it down. So to wash mm -hmm. the shit, you just... Yeah. I have that in downtown. Yeah. Again, I don't have to go up there and then switch exactly. it and go down and then look for the water and then go up and close it again. Every building is... It's a cost thing. People want... This is what I was in. That's it. My back. No, it's just warm. It's yeah. warm because of the... Yeah. This is one more thing, one more question. Yeah. So here's the... This is the domestic lines here. I'll get the valve charts for the heating. I'll, I'll make a call as soon as I get out of here. Once again, primer. Yeah. I need uh, one more outlet for this one. Well, now you gotta talk to the electrician. But, uh, and one more of this. Yeah. Well, you can either get uh, you can either get a splitter or you got probably 125. But don't forget, a lot of use. Right now, it's like that. You know, eight o'clock, seven o'clock, everybody's home. Those, the, usually they say it, it takes too long for them to get hot water. Okay, I know, but a lot of them, you have to understand, their expectations are just not. Like they it's expect for instantaneous. Right? Like yeah. even in my so house, you have to wait like a second. It's not just yeah. gonna be burning hot and then freezing cold. There's like a. That's why I keep checking that one, but it's totally. So it's when they fully complain open. to you about that, no, you don't touch these. These what? are set. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. But I, never open these. I was just checking it. So they these are set. fully these are open. Locked. And all the ones for all the risers are locked too. So. The riser at the end and the riser all the way to the other side are pulling the exact same amount of gallons per minute. Mm -hmm. So you have research lines, the water will no, keep I, flowing. Yeah, it's open roof, but water will keep flowing. I mean, but then from the main riser I've never been, like, to the my street, house, my, you my still have house like kid, used to wait five okay. minutes. Which ones were the inlet for the yeah, tank outlet it's for yeah, yeah, right we, we, we did this last time. Remember? Everything is in here. Yeah. <laughs> this thing yeah. This one is. This just covers a certain amount of. This one is so this open. does from ground to ten. To 10. And then the up. upper zone is eleven to sixteen. So All the right. way this building works is that the primary heating heats the domestic water. It's kind of like an energy saving. Kind of thing. Okay. So primary heating flows through the turbo tank, basically like heat exchangers. Mm -hmm. It flows back up. The domestic water flows through the turbo tanks and feeds the hot water into the building. The potable water. Okay. So this is a lot of Tridel, Nova Trend, this is what they use now. Those big red tanks. Oh. Not anymore. What are those? This? This is a fish tank. <laughs> <laughs> it, will, it will leave at some point. Yeah. Somebody's going to realize it. It's a lot. Yeah. And Provident control all the temperatures as well, other than you know the, uh, the mixing valves, but they control tank temperatures and whatnot. Provident controls everything, right? Very good. Yes, yeah, except the mixing one. That's the makeup water for this loop. No, for that one. Yeah. So basically, what happens is the pressure in the, the the primary heating pressure in these turbo tanks has to be less than the domestic pressure. So if we say there's a tank fail, the, the pressure of the domestic will push it up. 
That's why we have to do that. So this is at 40, and that water is at 80. And that's a restart farm, so that will keep the hot water flowing on the side. Sorry? Uh, the circulating pump. Right? That's a circulating for the primary heating. Yes. That's the research pump right there. All the starters are uh, lambicoid. Like they have two research? One here, one in the kind. Yeah. Okay. You guys have all access to all that. You guys can. Okay, it's all on the drawing anyway. Good. Everything's been balanced? Oh, yeah. And the balancing reports are in the. Uh, balancing reports, I think they got it already. So this gets fed, the valve is upstairs. Oh, so you put right. salt, and that's I know. It. Where's the valve? I can't read it. I what valve? Where. For what? It's upstairs in the roof. That's the one I want to know. Yeah, I'm going to show you right now. Oh, really? Yeah. You're going to stay here. Oh, my God. So those are? This is your driver should watch that. So. The only thing I need to do is switch both of this. Very good. Have fun. This is tested already. I'll make sure you watch it. Okay, these are all makeup waters for the heating system. The PRV, right? Yes. Where's the other lower PRV? Oh, that's in the lower mechanical, right? The one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Made it what makeup waters. Primer, domestic hot water, hot water mixing valves. We're all here. This one runs 24 hours. It should. Uh, we unplug it because when you plug it in, yeah. it will flood the uh, the generator. No, that was addressed. No, this one. Again, again. What they do? Though? What was the problem there? The problem right there. Yeah. This is not a problem because this one is usually uh, put water in the drain. So yeah. It. yeah. But that drain. Yeah. It's not. It's not draining, it's not, the water goes to the drain, it's not going there. Did I fix it yet? Are you sure? Did you talk to Christian? I know they looked at it, or whatever. I don't know. Okay, well, whatever, we'll deal with that. Uh, okay. okay, so what, what the... Uh, the last thing is ventilation. The pumps, anything you have questions, or just go with the VFDs settings. You have. I don't know. You just been monkey with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Twenty five psi. Basically, the way this is set up. So if you got zones opening and closing throughout the system, or three-way valves. The pressure drops, it's it's measuring differential pressure between the suction and the discharge, okay. and then feeding it into here. The set point is 250 psi, right, on the curve. So, 250 psi is Is that 25 or 250? 25. 25, sorry. Get going. <laughs> Right, so 25 psi is the set point pressure on the differential pressure. So what happens is, if the, if the pressure drops, the pump current moves down. Right? And the pumps will speed up to bring it back to, to set point pressure. Okay. And, and the opposite, if the pressure gets high, it's not. So um, that's, that's what the VFD is doing, is varying the speed of the pump. To maintain the 225 psi okay. differential pressure. So in this case, psi is 20, that's why you keep running? Okay. No, it's not the actual psi, it's the differential pressure between okay. suction and discharge. Okay. So the difference between suction and discharge is 25 psi. Okay. That's, that's what this here is. Now, maintenance wise, if you look at this, these units. They got grease service. Mm -hmm. It should be done once a year, minimum. Okay. I, I would suggest a changeover from heating to cooling. That maintenance gets done. That these things are grease. So you have to check each individual pump that you own. Not all of them have grease service. Once a year? You mean you say once a year? Once or, I, once or twice a year. The, the way these ones work is you take the, the screw at the bottom. 
minimum of once a year. Well, I, mean, I, I, I would do it. What I do is and each part, no matter whether, it depends on, depends on the manufacturer and the, and the horsepower range, whether it's a permanently sealed uh, bearing or it's greasable. These ones are greasable, for instance. So they can be greased. Other than that, mechanical seals, um, when they were what do you pull this one? I know there's primary primary heating. Primary heating. The heating water pump A7B. So this will heat, provide water for your unit heaters, uh, cabinet heaters, and the domestic. And the domestic. Okay. The system water pump pump provide for the fan coils. But that goes for every pump in the place. The small circulators are they're non. There's no moving, there's no leakage, there's no mechanical seals, no lubrication to be done. But on the larger pumps, all of the larger pumps, whether it's this just for chiller, chill water, and the other one, should be ripped at minimum. Other than that, if it leaks, we have a local, local service group, it's not covered by warranty, mechanical seals or not. So, hard pump. The Leslie and Resort Mills, or Flex Pumps and Motors, which is the other way it's at uh, Markham Road in the Forum. Uh, so, I don't know what else to do. This is not, this is not covered by the service of Johnson Johnson. The mechanical seals are not, no? No pump in. We, we, we cover warranty for 48 hours for startup. And then after that, it's a wear part, so your brakes in your car. Eventually, you're going to have to pay for your brakes. Okay. They will do the maintenance, but anything that wears out, it's for you guys. So you have to make sure Jones and Control is doing their maintenance properly. So every now and then, what I would recommend is heating. So yeah. what is primary heating? Primary heating does uh, the heaters, the rads, the hot water for the building. The, the domestic hot water. So basically, anything ex except the fan coils that need hot water will be supplied. Every hot water is supplied with this one, except the fan coils. Yes, yes. Okay. fan coils are Because those pumps. Oh, here we have a garage exhaust fan. Um, it turns on when there's a call for CO, too much carbon monoxide in the driving area. These will turn on, and I think the intake air is uh, right down that way. Anyways, um, so you have belts in here. They should be inspected once a month, um, but they'll, uh, they're probably good for, for about a year. Um, and then they need to be maintained, obviously. There's grease nipples on the shaft bearings up there. So this unit, depending how much it runs, should be greased every six to eight months. Your maintenance company will have a better idea um, when they start going through everything. Which is me. Okay, so like, you know, like after two years you'll say, hey, these need to be greased more or less or whatever, right? Depending on usage, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, I have a question, quick question. Yeah. The dampers, the, uh -huh. the uh, gravity dampers? Yes. The gravity dampers, are they meant to be lubricated or not? Um, they probably should be. Like I've been to jobs uh, where they needed lubrication, right? But it's, it's not really part of the maintenance package. Like I've been to a lot of jobs where they never get lubed and they, they work all the time, right? No, I'm just making sure you're saying it so that we all can hear it, right? Because I, they're they're just you know a piece of metal sitting in a bushing, mm -hmm. right? That's all they are. They're gravity. The dampers yeah. on the outside, mm -hmm. so they actually open when the fan starts to create pressure and it pushes the dampers open. They close based on no pressure. What you find though is that if you use the wrong type of grease and if you use like a lithium grease or a white grease, it, it becomes tacky. Oh. And what happens when the fan starts, any dust gets stuck on there, that yeah, creates, they start, start seizing up. If you use a graphite-based grease, mm -hmm. it's better, but if you look at the manufacturer's recommended maintenance on that, they don't want you to use any lubricant at all. Well, these fans get used all the time. I guarantee you they're, they're probably, they should be turning on like four or five times a day at least. Um, so if they keep opening and closing, you won't, you won't have to grease them, right? Amen. Yeah. So if they're being right. used, they, you, they don't need to be greased. Once they stop being used, like, that's when they start to How, many, how many fans do we have? Two? Just this, this one. This one. Just two. So these are the only two? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, then we'll, we'll, we'll know as we go along. Uh, is there access into the shaft? You know? So up there, you have a stair press fan. It's got grease nipples. 
It's got um, a belt that should be, you know, maintained. The belt probably has to be changed. Not very often because it only has to be tested once a month to make sure it works because it's fire safety. Um, the grease nipples should be greased every uh, every six to eight months. So what's this? Stair press fan. Stair press case. fan. If there's a fire, the fan turns off, pressurizes the staircase, um, and keeps the fire out of the staircase because that's where people exit through if there is a fire. So where's the actual fan? Inside there. It's inside that access door. Well, so those small like bent in there, that's where it goes? That's where it supplies air, yes. Yeah. Okay. So if you pressurize your, your staircase, so the air is flowing inside, outside mm -hmm. the staircase, so no smoke comes in, no fire comes in. That's right. So, yeah, when people are leaving, like if there's a fire and people are running from the 16th floor, mm -hmm. you don't want to get them caught up with smoke, right? Cause then yeah, you keep everything out of there. Because that's, their, that's an, their getaway. But this is an auto. This, will, this should be an auto position. It will yeah. run time to time. You, you, are, you whoever, test it on hand, but it, uh, it should be in the auto position. It'll go off with the fire alarm. Where's the starter for this, you know? Probably the electrical room. Can we go? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we gotta go to the electrical room anyways. Yeah. So here we have an air conditioner. Um, runs off the thermostat. No, that's not the thermostat. Thermostat's right here. Oh. Find this ladder. Okay. Um, there's a filter in here that the filter should be looked at. This is an electrical room, so it's gonna get hot. It's gonna the air conditioner is gonna run all all year long. Um, that, uh, that filter in there should be, uh, it's washable, it's not replaceable, so it should be washed every four to six months. Who's doing it? Me. Yeah, Johnson Controls should do it. So you have to just make sure they know when they do it. Okay, so this one's for this the, the staircase. Stair yes. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. And I set a toggle. So what's this for? I, I couldn't... This is air conditioning for the electrical room. And they also have this great big uh, Del High fan here. Del High fan runs off of the thermostat. If it gets too hot, that turns on. That's probably like a secondary cooling. So that's your first stage, second stage kind of thing. Um, there are no grease nipples in there, but um, there is a belt that should be looked at. Uh, depending on how much this thing gets used, every six to eight months and replaced if needed. Okay. The condensing unit is next to the louvers outside. Pardon? The condensing unit for this? Yes. You want to go look at the condensing unit? It's, it's at the louver outside. This one uh, service every three months? Four months? Uh, four to six months. Four to six months. The filter should be cleaned. They're washable, right? Is that yeah, they're washable. You just run them under uh, like warm water. Okay. Okay, so this is the condenser here. Um, the only maintenance on this that should be required is to make sure that the coil is clean. Uh, if you see that it gets really dusty down here, it just needs to be power washed and uh, should be okay for about... So it's, it's okay to use water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure the power is off though. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah. you should be cleaned every three to five years. Okay? Depends like how dusty you get. Like you get out, outside air coming through and everything like that, right? But it should be okay. Alright? Alright. Yeah, right. Okay. Are you running? Now I am. Okay, you are. Okay, so my name is Brian. I'm here from BAC. We supply the uh, cooling tower for this uh, project. Uh, I'll just give you a basics of what a cooling tower is, what it's used for, and we'll go from there. So basically what this cooling tower does is it cools water on the condenser side of your chiller. Evaporators does it on the uh, building side, this is on the condenser side. So whatever water is there on the condenser side is essentially dumped on top of the tower. It flows down to the sump here. Mm -hmm. And heat transfer occurs when you see these boarded up things. Those obviously come out at some point when you're putting the unit into operation and you'll actually see something like this, right? So air goes in from here, air comes in from the other side, there's a fan in the middle, it sucks up air and the water that is trickling down gets cooled and then it's sent back to the chip. So that's basically all there is. It's called an open style cooling down because it's open to the environment, there's no pressure here. 
everything is uh, gravity based. So the cooling tower, this is a single piece cooling tower, right? Sometimes we get one where they're stacked pretty big. This is a single style cooling tower. You've got water basically being dumped from the top. Sarah, you can open the door from now. So you this is that door? You want that door? No. Never mind. <laughs> so you want that's your fan. This is the view from the top of the tower. Can you just take it? No, no, no. So you got air coming in from both sides. Water essential. Water basically is being dumped in here, right? You see, you'll see there's piping on the top. Water is dumped on both sides of the tower, and then it this fan is basically sucking air. That's basically all there is to it. Now, from a maintenance perspective, there's two sides to it: the air side and the water side. As far as the water side goes, it's a lot easier too. It's a water side goes, um, you've got something, um, uh, water treatment, make sure that you're always on top of that. That usually adds a lot of years to the cooling tower. Uh, a lot less, you know, uh, scaling and this and that and the other. Make sure that you do water treatment. And so it, it absorbs water from the right Correct. Side. No, no. What water treatment is, is you have somebody, have they done water treatment? Yeah, no. remember no, those no, chemical no. treatment? I know, I know that one, but I'm just asking if the water coming from the rain goes there. Yes, no, it no, goes no. in there. That, it does that, but that's not a big concern. The water treatment is required because of the quality of water that you yeah, use yeah. run through. Right? So you have scale, you have fire, Make All sure it's clean. Yeah, the water is clean. Now, before you use the tower the first time, there's something called passivation that you have. Passivation is basically seasoning of the cooling tower so that you kind of get a thin layer built into the basement and the general uh, overall body of the tower so that it doesn't, because you're sitting out here, there's water going through it. Though all of this stuff is galvanized, you'll still end up catching rust. Mm -hmm. And that is basically what passivation does. It, there's a pH value for the water. It's a little technical, but I'll quickly explain it to you. There's a pH value on the water, which is like 7.9. That's what you're trying to maintain. The water quality guys usually do that. They passivate the cooling tower before it goes into the water. If you do it once before it starts, that's when you season the tower, and then you continue running the tower all the time. Uh, so the first thing is water treatment. Make sure that you're on top of that, and there's enough chemicals and all of that stuff that is taken care of. The second thing is, do you see this? That is a strainer, okay? That is located on the outlet here. So if you open that door, there's a walkway right below that is the spring. So if you are planning to, say, drain this tower down in the winter and you're not running it at all, then you will have to make sure that that is clean. And then come spring, when you're starting up the tower, make sure that the strainer is clean, right? It doesn't have any dirt, debris, leaves, or anything like that. So that's one filter you need to, or one strainer that you need to clean. Well, you see these are doors here, right, with handles. That's basically what this is. So if you were to open those little wing nuts, you can lift the doors up, and you'll see a bunch of nozzles there. Those nozzles need to be cleaned periodically as well, because whatever water you're dumping into the tower, if it has scale, dust, all of that stuff, it will start filling up, and that nozzle eventually gets clogged, and you'll see leaves coming from the top of the tower. Then you know that that is the reason why you need to do that. Uh, this is a very big picture of there's a little nozzle. Yeah. You need to make sure those are clean. Uh, I don't think there's a heater on this project. No, because no. two pipes. Uh, no. You don't have heaters no. for the no. winter, right? Okay, so that's you don't even need to worry about. So those are the things you need: the water treatment, the strainer, and the nozzles on top. That is what you do from the water side. Uh, passivation, of course. As far as the air side goes, it's like any other rotating piece of equipment. You've got a fan, you've got blowers, you've got motors, things like that. If you were to open this door, you can actually see all of it right there. It's very easy to access. You don't, I'm guessing you're going to get someone to do the service on it, but yeah. make sure you're on top at of least it. I know. Yeah. yeah, so at least make sure that you're on top of it and you know what exactly needs to be done. Again, you're in a certain, you're certainly tall enough that in the building's tall enough that you're not going to be in too much trouble, but these air inlets sometimes tend to suck in paper and birds and nests and things like that. Make sure that it is clean all the time or it will affect your airflow system. Okay? That's, that I have to do. Yeah, for again, sure. when you do your weekly or monthly maintenance, regular walk checks, I check for leaks, things like that. Do you want to go in? It's getting cold here and we can explain if there's anything else I can tell you. There's nothing else left here other than that. This one just has one fan, right? Sorry? It only has one fan? It just has one fan. So okay. one fan, one motor. Probably a two, two uh, um, One thing I noticed, maybe you can talk about, is like adjusting the float manually. 
Yeah, I'll, it's easier to show it to you because everything's closed there, so I'll. Yeah. I don't want to stand out in the cold. Fair enough. It's a lot of your makeup valve, okay? So. When you open the door, remember where I showed you the pipe? Mm -hmm. When you open the door, you won't miss it. It's right there on your left side. It's a basically a float base. Same thing that you have in your toilet. Like mm -hmm. when you look yeah. at the toilet bowl, you see that bowl. Same concept. So what it is, it's just an arm mm -hmm. that keeps going up. As and when the water fills and the arm goes up, it stops more water from coming. See, what happens is when the cooling tower is running, say in the middle of uh, August, it's hot outside, there's a lot of humidity and there's a lot of water going out as drift. And you also have a small amount of water purposely being leaked through the cooling tower. It creates sort of like a continuous motion so that you don't have any, uh, any mineral buildup at the bottom of the tower. So all of those things are accounting for losses mm -hmm. from the cooling tower. So if you were to fill the pan up uh, in the morning today and then come back a week later, the level would have dropped owing to you know, the losses from all of this. So you're trying to keep that by keeping the makeup water line on all the time, but you don't want to overfill it. Right? Mm -hmm. So it is usually set before the cooling tower starts and as part of your regular maintenance procedure, if you ever see you know, water overflowing when the system turns off or you generally see overflow, it's usually because the makeup is not set correctly. There's a couple of wing nuts in there, all you have to do is turn it a little bit loose, drop it down, tighten it and you'll be good to go. So that's something to keep an eye on, it usually doesn't need a lot of maintenance but that's something uh, your maintenance techs can take, take a look at. And uh, once in a year, just make sure that the arm is still you know, moving properly, it's not getting jammed. That's, mm -hmm. what but that's probably the other thing you might want to keep an eye out for. Yeah. Uh, it's not, not a lot otherwise, and there's usually a, a small so the, the unfortunate part was that the drain was uh, directly piped to drain. So it, there's no opening, so it doesn't, flip, it doesn't go onto the roof, it goes right down through the roof line. So How do you find out if it's overflowing or not? Is there anywhere to hear it? Or? Well, the complaint from the suite down below, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, okay. Now, okay. We, 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 we check the tower on a, on a monthly basis anyway. Oh, okay. Then you guys yeah, would yeah, know exactly what's We do all on. this. That's okay. Yeah, 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 okay. He, he's learning. We do all everything he just said, mm -hmm. we do for you. Oh, okay. All right. You don't I have know, to do this. Okay. Right. Oh, at least, yeah. So he's in the loop like, and he yeah, knows yeah, what exactly But it's just like, like what he said. I, like, uh, Checks and balances, to, yeah. basically. You need to know what you're doing. Because you're not here all the time. Once a month, right? Yeah, once yeah. a month. And, and the yeah. chemical guys will know too if you're overflowing too. Just at least, to show you. At least when things, when there's a problem in that, in that uh, particular equipment. You get the call. I, right? yeah. we, we get to come in. I know when to call. Yes. Yeah. It's just unfortunate because that is probably the, you know, the, the waste of water yes. is the most costly thing. Yeah. Chemical and, and chemicals water. chemicals too. Yeah. And then if they pipe it right like they did, you don't see that. Right, and you know, most of the time when he's here during the day, if he goes up and decides he wants to open up the door and have a look inside while the tower is running, I mean, we all we all do it yeah. just to see where the level's at. Unfortunately, you know, that's, it's a lot of work to, yeah. just to see if it's overflowing. And it won't tell you when the unit is running because the water level is constant. You will change as soon as you open up yeah, that yeah, door a little yeah, bit, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's again, <clears throat> water meter runs. You know, your water bills mm -hmm. go up. You know where the leaks are. You basically trace it. But at least you know in this case where to look for and what to look for. You know, who's gonna, the first guy to complain usually. Are the uh, water treatment guys because they're going for chemicals. Uh, <laughs> like the water bottle's open. Come on, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's funny because the one that filter in the cooling tower, I've seen, I've been in five buildings and I've seen only one, only one guy doing cleaning it. Really? Okay. Well, you have a red light. Come on when you're recording. Are you Good now. Yeah. Okay, you're on? Yeah. You're going to edit this in case I start swearing. Well, you're actually taking it. Okay. No, it's for my phone. Okay, so you don't but, care if I swear. But he will. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Okay, so these are your primary boilers. These control your sweet heating, domestic hot water, miscellaneous heating for your basement loops, everything in the whole building. So um, if these go down, you'll lose your hot water, sweet heating, everything. Uh, we control the boilers using a 4 to 20 signal right here that you'll see. Right now we're only giving it 3.9 milliamps, which is because this boiler is in standby mode. Um, this boiler is on, so you'll see 8 milliamps. Um, it says run central heat. Watch this step when you go. New thing. Is it wet? Yeah. Oh, okay. I said run twice. <laughs> okay. Um, when we get alarms, because we can't tell if the actual boiler is firing, but we do get a lockout alarm. So if you see this 
red light on here. You also get a red indicator light on here that you've seen before. You'll just come and press this reset button. That'll clear the alarm. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, these are your boiler cert pumps. We have a status on them, but they are controlled using the boiler. They're on in hand because the boiler guys have liked them on. Um, boilers won't fire without this on, so that's a big, uh, big thing too. Go to the season water pump. Okay, so here you have heating water pumps one and two. These are like lead lag standby rotation. Um, you've been rotating them every Friday, just putting one in hand, one on and one off. Um, we monitor these so if we see them fail or we see one not on at all times, we'll call you and give you a show and we'll get a page. Um, we also see any alarms that come up on these as well. So if we see an alarm, we'll blast the company set up. We have pressure sensors on this loop um, that allows to see the uh, what PSI is going through the pipes. Um, we supply the main loop up here, upper and lower domestic in the miscellaneous heating down in the under slab heating in P1. Yeah, okay, that's it for this one. Yeah, those other I don't think it's all wet. That's same thing. Okay. Yeah, same thing with this pump because it's drum floss. All we can do is pick up a status. So I think if it, my program says if it's winter or below a certain temperature and we see this go off, then we'll get a, an alarm. So what this... Uh, this is a glycol heating pump. So it takes the hot boiler water, it exchanges it here, and it adds glycol to this system so that the cleaning coil won't freeze. Glycol's... Uh, anti-freezing uh, solution. Um, so that is only used in uh, the winter, and then in the summer you'll have cooling going through the coil. This will all be off and probably isolated. Uh, the valve will be shut. So this valve right now is what controls your set point in the winter. So sometimes you'll see that modulating. Right now it's partially open. Actually, it looks like it's closed. Might be open a small valve, letting a little bit of heat through to heat up the coil. Um, so the VFE, we control the start stop and the speed. So if you ever wanted to speed up the fan, if you don't, if you find you don't have enough ventilation or um, in the corridors, you can call us and we can increase the speed. So um, why is to increase the speed just in case? Yeah, never hurts. If you have some people that smoke in their suites or if you get cooking odors or anything like that, we can always speed up the fans a little bit just to keep it out of the hallways. Um, so this is interlocked with the freestat here. So if the freestat trips off, it's a protection device that will shut off the VFD. But you know that, you've uh, reset it multiple times for us. Um, and we also have temperatures on these coils so we can help diagnose like if the, the cooling valve it fails or the heating valve fails, we can tell by the temperature of the coils. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. These are, you know what these are, right? What is this? For example, oh, you got you, you write that down? Yeah, you see it. Okay. Hey. We got a sensor on them yeah. now? I, I think I was going to go fast, so it helps. I like how they put some uh, temperature gates on there. There was originally no problem. Okay, so this is your centrifugal chiller. This is where you get your cooling in the summertime. Uh, we will control this come summer. We'll shut it off based on outdoor air. So if we see outdoor air below a temperature, for example, say 50 degrees, we'll shut it off. And if it gets warm again, we will turn it back on. Um, we can also have a status on this. So we can tell you if it's on or off. We have temperatures on the cooling inlet and outlet, and also the condenser inlet and outlet. So we can help diagnose issues with that. Um, these are your system water pumps. You've got, similar to your heating water pumps, one should be running at all times. Um, you're rotating them once a week. We have pressure sensors again, so we can tell what PSI is going through the fan coils. Um, and you also have a control valve up there for the winter fan coil temperature setback. Are we controlling that one? Yeah. So we, we can do a changeover for them? No, that's um, like a fan coil reset valve. Are like we controlling the summer winter changeover no, we though? No, we do those sort of manual valves. Yeah, so they have to come physically, unisolate, open up, and 
but that one is just going to be wide open for cooling season and then in the winter we start modulating it to throttle back the boiler come through. Yeah. So you rotate system water, hot water, and condenser water pumps? Right? The one no. Uh, yeah, you've never the, gone over the condenser, whether, that's whether an that got figured out or not. <laughs> We'll see. Because oh, okay. there's, there's should have, chiller guys should have had uh, a lead lag controller installed, but that's uh, we'll have to figure that out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Only the primary, uh, primary and this one. We might add the condensers. We'll see. When it comes summertime, you might go and rotate those ones as well. But we'll we'll let you know about that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, domestic. Sure. This yeah. is upper and then lower. Yeah, is the same. lower is the same, right? Uh, okay, so this is your upper domestic zone, uh, tanks 4 and 5, this serves from floors 11 to 16, so the upper half of the building. Um, you have this heat exchange pump that sends the water through these high efficiency heat exchangers. You've got a control valve that's controlled by us, so it's a 0 to 10 modulating valve. Um, and we control that valve based on what the discharge of the tanks is. So the tanks Below set point, we'll open up the valve, and if it's above set point, we can close the valve. Where is the actual supply for this tank? Uh, that so goes to the unit. Goes to the temporary yeah. valve? Yeah. That's our sensor up there. So if you look. Is this the supply? These pipes here, yeah. So, so that's it? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that takes, you know, it's that reading 150. Yeah. So I think that's boiler water, not. Tank water. So that's like the temperature of this in here, and this, yeah, you don't have one on that pipe. No, it should be 150. And then you mix it, right? Yeah, and I'm just not sure what we have. Yeah, see, our tank's only at 140. So I think what he's looking at is the boiler water. Oh. I don't even, I'm never even sure about these things. So that they show. It's that one. No? Um, it's that one. Yeah, that's similar. So see how you got. No, that's 140. Maybe because the valve's closed. If that's boiler water coming into the tank mm -hmm. to heat it up. Because based on the tank right there, that's the supply. Yeah. Yeah, so that's boiler water coming in. And then I think this gauge is the temperature of the water inside there. I'm not 100% sure though. So the supply gauge is not, it's not there. There's no, there's no gauge for the supply. Um, well, yeah. you use... Yeah, you can kind of look at this. No, there isn't. Is that not his hot side? So oh, it's the same the mixing bowl? That's the mixing bowl. Yeah, okay, I was thinking that this was the mixing, but this is the other two. I guess that's um, the one. That's well, the that's, final. That's, that's, that's two the final. Suites. Yeah, so you almost should have one somewhere on this pipe, so you can come down and look and be like, oh, my tank's low, right? And you can't really tell. But that's what we're for, right? So if we see a low tank temperature on our sensor or our other sensor up there, we'll also call you and tell you, okay, you might need to get a, a plumber in to check your tempering valve. So if it's uh, just in case low amount of hot water, what should I do? Um, well, first, you should I ask if you're going to complain to review if we don't call you. you. Should I uh, close this one a little bit? Which one's? Hey, the mixing this one's cold, right? So yeah. if, if anything, you if there's no enough you can water, start throttling back cold. Yeah. But that stuff that plumbers would do, you just pretty much come up and check. Yeah, my temperatures are low. They're all low. And then so, you call a plumber because so I don't it need could to be do that. Thing failing. Yeah. No. So if it's low, uh, the plumber will adjust the mixing valve here, right? But call winds or whatever. Bimo, they'll come come here and do it. Once the building, right now they probably adjusted for the current occupancy, but once the building is 100% occupied, they right? will set it again. They yeah. will adjust it again. I'll say call them again for sure to adjust the mixing valve. I'm not sure, but they took our well, so I had to take it out. <laughs> but yeah, you don't even have your own sensor on the hot tank. Oh, 
Okay, so yeah, just these two basement loops. These, so these are your under slab heating loop actuators. So that's how we control the temperature to the under slab loops. They just keep the floors warm for any suites or amenity areas on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. So they're out in the parking areas. And you can see them. It looks something like that uh, fin and rad tube here. Mm -hmm. So that's what dissipates the heat out of those and warms up the floor so nobody's got cold floors, right? So you got two separate loops, north and south, the one actuator for each one. We control those actuators with a zero to 10 signal. And we have sensors on the loop return that we try and maintain a minimal return. And then in the, and in the winter, we shut the valve and that loop is all closed. What's that called again? For the summer. Pardon? What's that called again? Um, we call it miscellaneous heating. It can be yeah. under slab heating loops, uh, basement loops, a couple different names for it. Yeah. But that, usually those are just pretty something that we just keep an eye on on our side. You shouldn't really have to come check on it because there's not even any temperature cases for you. <laughs> oh, no? No, I don't see it. Not um, even our sensors? Even. We have our sensors. Well, we have our sensors there, but there's no yeah. need just for him to come look at. Like, it's just, let's just say here, cool uh, One thing I'll say during the summertime. Element return. It's the element return. Yeah, see, that's our actuator closing because temperature well, that's a damper. Oh, no, that's that. I thought it was this thing closing. I don't remember being that loud, but... <laughs> so, like, during the summertime, uh, we'll shut those off because you don't want to heat up the suite during summertime, right? Yeah, yeah we don't want to heat the floor. So you can come double-check. Uh, if you want, you can close off the isolation valve. Yeah, yeah. So one, 211 one? and yeah. what? 213. 213. So what does that say over here? Does Element say, return. Yeah, so bare elements. So come... Come summertime, I would isolate those just because even Alto, we, they kind of dissipate heat through. And yeah. So that where the water coming to the pump drive? No, no, from the boilers. Boilers. Going to these uh, fin and rab tube heaters, so remember, bare element heaters. Remember we told you high uh, hot water pumps, which were supplying the heaters and all the miscellaneous. Yeah. So this is called miscellaneous kind of heating. Okay. So. During the summertime, obviously you don't want to heat up the building, right? Because mm -hmm. then your chiller will be working harder. But the boiler will be running 24-7 because it's also serving a domestic. Yes. So if you isolate the valves and isolate the loop, then no hot water will be flowing and the suites can cool down faster. Then you won't get, else you'll get complaints from the ground floor suites that, hey, we, it's like too hot for us or our floor is too hot. So that way... Because sometimes these, these actuators, they. They'll, they'll tend to open up a little bit because the pressure pushes them open so a little bit. So that where controls like the ground floor to ten? No, or no. all the building. So just the two. There's only two under slab heating loops in this P1 area. So they it goes out, branches out. One goes that way, and one goes this way. And all they do is make sure the floor above on the ground floor is not too cold. Okay, so, yeah. only so only ground, only oh. this floor, and only keeps the floor warm for gr anybody on the ground floor. So it's like me if I am so the suite yeah. in ground floor. Yeah. yeah. If it's too cold in my if you felt your floor, floor was cold, you'd be like, oh, crank the heat up in my my basement loop temps because my floor is cold. But because if gone. you live on the ground floor, it's not fair to you that the parking level is too cold and your suite is getting cold while yeah. someone on the second floor is warm, right? So they're just trying to make all the suites kind of comfortable and anybody above a cold area like this, they want so to... So this is mainly for the ground floor? Yeah, yeah, only the ground floor pretty much. So in the summer, close this just to make sure and in the winter time open it. Because it gets, like, gets too hot in the summer. Yeah, yeah. sometimes, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, in winter time you make sure you open them up so... Yeah. Treats and off Okay, I think that's, that's it. Good. Any other controls questions you have or